I was angsty, but I wasn't anxious. Anxious anxiety comes later. Yeah. It does come later. It does Some people later. get it when they're... Some people get it when they're young. Yeah. yeah. But most of the time it's later. I hated those people though. I was like, oh God. That they had anxiety? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I was a teenager. <laughs> I was like, what's your problem? <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with you guys? Just like have fun. Oh. Um, let's see. All right, we're here. We're starting. We're doing it. Dr. Jameson Webster is here. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Seriously. Uh, for people listening who uh, don't know you, do you want to... Give them a little rundown on your background. On my background? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I am a psychoanalyst in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess primarily Freudian. I don't know if that means anything to anybody. Um, Probably something they learned in, like, you know, their Psych 101 class. Right. But... Well, you learned that Freud's wrong and that he was a cokehead. I was going to bring that up. Okay. Like, you, yeah, you <laughs> learned that, like, uh, cigars are... All cigars are dicks, some, like, the foulest thing. You learn about... Um, uh, your edible complex, yeah. edible, every guy has that. And then there's like kind of the electric complex, but not really as proven. And then, yeah, he was like a psycho who was doing, me or not meth, coke all the time. <laughs> and then he's just discredited. Right. right. Yeah. And he was from the Victorian times and he's a misogynist. I've heard it all. Yeah. And you're like, no. No. Okay. No. What, uh, what caused you to believe deeply in Freud? In Freud? I mean, when I read it as a 16-year-old, I went to college early. It just Really? It you just, went to college at 16? I went to college. Uh, I did. Go. I went to college at 16 because I hated high school. Uh-huh. Um, and they gave me Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. And the three guys just seemed, like, right about the world. Yeah, Nietzsche is, Nietzsche is interesting. Yeah. Guy's dead, all that. Yeah. I remember I read that in my philosophy class. Marx, haven't read that much of him. And he's got a real <laughs> bad rap. He's got a bad rap. He's oh, right, because of what happened, of, right? But I will say, I haven't read it. I, I will, being open to all of it, should read. Uh, what's his, the famous work? Um, the, well, Capital. Yeah. Uh, but, like, I think, is Engels worse than Marx in terms of, like, how it led to cap or um, socialism or communism or... Wait, Marx was just, I mean, he was a writer and a mm -hmm. theorist, and he believed in the communist revolution, but he didn't necessarily have a program. So it's the people who implemented it. So if you think of what happened with Tolstoy or what, I mean, Tolstoy with the Russians. Stalin. Um, Stalin, yeah. So there's where the problem is, but that's very different from Marx, who was creating a way of analyzing civilization, which both Nietzsche and Freud did. And these yeah. these three guys, and you know, now it's like you're not supposed to read the old white male European canon stuff. It's yeah, you know, like completely all discredited. Like, yeah, it's just you know, it's just bad. But you know, for me it was a moment when I think that you could try to create a theory of everything. We can't do that anymore. So Freud created, you know, a kind of theory of everything. Nietzsche had a theory of everything and Marx had a theory of everything. Um and that was really helpful to me when I was 16, a 16 and, year old, and yeah. nothing made any sense and I hated everybody. And um, so I, it, for me, it was amazing. And the first thing I read of Freud was a case that he wrote um, about a 16 year old girl, actually, who's, who's known as Dora. It's not her real name. Mm -hmm. um, and she was hysterical and her parents were like in this sexual intrigue, the father was screwing the woman and then the woman's husband was hitting on Dora and Dora's mother was nowhere to be seen and was like compulsively cleaning the house and she developed all of these symptoms and so the case was about that and I identified with this. Oh really? Yeah. Did yeah. from personal experience with your family or just as a with the idea that someone caught in a family that is doing things that don't entirely make a lot of sense to you makes you um, crazy <laughs> and makes you have a lot of strange problems, and, you know. Yeah. And like you know, when she comes to see Freud, he says, you know, like everything you say is true, but what do you want? And then she couldn't answer that question, and then that's when the analysis starts. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so you reading that. Did you first think, oh, this is going to help me? Like, how did that lead to you eventually wanting to do that psychoanalysis for other people? Do it myself? Well, I went to analysis shortly mm. after that. I had to get to New York City to find an analyst. Um, so, for sorry, um, 
Psychoanalysis is different than we would say normal talk therapy. How so? Because I know there's like CBT, which is right. like cognitive behavioral therapy. And then, I mean, I I took, I was a psych minor and uh-huh. I would, wanted to be a major and then they weren't going to give me a double major. So I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to do the minor stuff. But I remember learning about behaviorism, like all right. that stuff into mm-hmm. it. But the the most effective one I remember reading about was CBT in right. terms of, and there's also, I guess, behavioral therapy that might be an offshoot of that. Right. But what what's the, for people at home listening, what's the big difference what's between? What's the difference? Um, I mean, there's so many therapies now, it's really confusing. So people often don't even know what they're getting. But the, Yeah, I have no the, idea what I'm getting. The main two different ones were either you were in psychotherapy, which is a kind of psychoanalysis light. Okay. But it means you're investigating whatever, your childhood, your feelings, your unconscious stuff. Um, or you're in CBT, which is trying to change the cognitive thoughts that you have that are leading to your problems. So they're saying, uh, you know, so when you're depressed, it's just that you have bad negative thinking and you have to undo the bad negative thoughts or stop them rather than understand that you, you know, wanted to sleep with your mother or whatever. Oh, okay. Right. All right. I think the one I've experienced is doesn't feel like either of those. It more feels like you're having bad negative thoughts and to separate yourself from, from that, them. to realize that like your brain, um, your mind and your brain are not the same thing right. and that you're all, your brain is a thought machine. And so these things are going to happen and like changing the lens that maybe you see things through mm-hmm. and understanding that you're not potentially causing all these set, like you get set in patterns. Mm-hmm. I, I personally kind of believe that if you tell yourself you're a depressive person or um, if you tell yourself I'm very anxious, I I kind of feel like your brain likes to take the easiest route mm-hmm. and and works in terms of like strengthening different neural connections. So if it goes, okay, this is the connection we're having and we're seeing uh, you know, the examples of this in life, we're going to strengthen this, strengthen this, strengthen this to where it becomes uh, su- subconscious or unconscious and kind of lead you towards right. there. And the one I've experienced is kind of trying to pull you back from it. Right. Which is, would that be called CBT or? It's probably closer to CBT. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not that you don't do that kind of a thing as an analyst to the extent that you try to disrupt the patient's like conscious discourse with themselves because we all mm-hmm. run around telling ourselves something. But we're trying to get to a different level of thought underneath that that we call whatever, the unconscious, rather than just stop the conscious thing that's not helping you. I mean, we do that as well, but we're also like, this is why we we work on dreams a lot. And yeah. you lie down on the couch and you do the free association thing. So it's it's just, it's, it's different um, ways of probably getting at the same thing. Okay. But with very different sets of beliefs, I think. Like um, that the unconscious is leading towards like sp- these specific conscious anxieties or? That the unconscious is um, a set of thoughts, feelings, memories, fantasies that you can't access very easily and that you need a special procedure in order to get closer to that, which okay. is what the analyst helps you do. Um, which does often cut through the anxiety or cut through different, you know, patterns that people have and that are usually making them miserable. Um, but it's a much longer process and not everybody needs to know all that dirt under the... They don't want to. They don't want to, no. Yeah, it's hard to face yourself in the mirror. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd, you'd like pretty much shred your, um, a lot of what you believe in analysis. So really, you have to be up for that. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think Freud has been so wildly discredited or attempted to? I mean, I would say that the kinds of things that psychoanalysis believes are very hard to square with how we like to think about ourselves in life. So, um, how difficult sexuality is is like kind of the main one of the main Freudian points that sexuality mm-hmm. is, you know big motivator in life and it's shaping a lot of our actions and that it's very disruptive. Um, 
So while we might see evidence of that everywhere, we don't, want, I don't think people really want to think about it so much. You just kind of want to be a person in the world and not have to yeah. think about the fact that, you know, everyone's thinking about sex all the time. So I think that's hard. Um, so a lot of times we're accused of being perverts. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, you guys are the ones who are perverse since you think that everything is about sex. Everything's related to sex, yeah, libido, sex, stuff like that. sexuality, libido. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's tough. I think the idea that there's huge major portions of your mind that are out of your control is also not what we like to think. You know, we like to think that we have a lot of control um, in the world and that we like really consciously kind of understand what we're doing. So this like radical concept that the unconscious is huge and it's pulling all the strings is not a particularly nice idea. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a problem. Um, is it maybe a problem that it's it feels less provable and is a little bit more like there's this other thing that we can never pinpoint and really speak with or consciously access and that's what's causing all of it. Uh-huh. Yeah. It feels like um not a panacea but like a I don't want to call it like a godlike figure but this other that's mm-hmm. in you but you can't connect to it. At least you can. But psychoanalysis think that they can, or uh, believe that they can help you connect with it more. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, make 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 friends with it a little more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but how would something? I think one of the biggest things that I like I try to grapple with or understand with the unconscious is like, okay, I'm taking it. I know that your brain takes in a lot more information than you're consciously aware of it'd be impossible for you, like your brain is a filter. Like that's what, a lot of what it does is right. filtering out a lot of unnecessary information. Um, so I can understand how something would get in to maybe the unconscious mm-hmm. that would affect you. But at the same time, a big question for me is how would I not see that or pinpoint as something of interest? Mm-hmm. Because my I'm I'm usually going to be interested in the most important things that are happening. So like what's going to get into my, is it, is it uh, from experiences that are getting in like into the past that maybe you're, is it like trauma that's in the unconscious or like how, like what, how is it getting in there? I think is a big question that I'm like, how would that happen? Well, I mean, one way I like to talk to students about this often is Mm -hmm. if you think about dreams so dreams happen without you, right? I mean, you're the, they happen while you're unconscious and they asleep. They happen to you, yeah. They happen to you. And they're often incredibly elaborate, incredibly vivid, intense. You feel more, see more vividly sometimes than you do in everyday life. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, where did all of that come from? It's kind of incredible that this thing happens to you when you're not awake, when you're literally not there. Yes, Um, and that to me like gives you a kind of sense of what's going on in the unconscious. And it's not just that the unconscious is that you've taken in or had a traumatic experience or don't remember what happened when you were five years old. Like, yes, it's also all those things, but it's also a level of intensity that we screen out in order just to be people who have to get to work every day and live and live. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, and and the idea is that, you know, (laughs) we should probably access this place where things are much more alive. Mm -hmm. Um, Although it's also very scary. I mean, part of the thing that happens to us at night is that we have horrific nightmares. I mean, it's really terrifying sometimes, the things that happen to you in your dreams. In your dreams. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't had recurring dreams, but I've heard of people having like Uh the same dream over and over. Yeah. I think maybe it it could just be that for whatever reason, I don't want to say my unconscious isn't as strong, but I haven't had those types of experiences with it. Um, but I find it, I think everyone wants to know what dreams mean. Yeah. And seems like psychoanalysis is one of the few that's actually like, we can, let's get into it. Let's try and figure out. It's my favorite part of the work. I mean, it's a problem because my patients know this. And so you know, they want to come bring like really wonderful dreams, which isn't uh-huh. great because you're supposed to be pretty neutral about, you know, you can, bring, okay. you know, you don't necessarily want to entertain your analyst, but <laughs> or let your patients know what's entertaining to you. But I mean, I, it is my favorite part of the work because it, um, you know, it just happens. Like they have a dream. 
you ask them about different aspects of it, and the ses- those sessions are often really beautiful because they're they're perfect. I mean, you know, what mm-hmm. the dream happens, what they end up saying about it, what comes to light in the session is usually um, just so rigorous. And it happens despite me, and it happens despite the patient. It just happens. And that's what you're always kind of looking for as an analyst, is this... Um, Unbiased, because it's like, it's almost like they're watching a movie, so it kind of doesn't feel like them. Mm-hmm. At least for me, when mm-hmm. I think about dreams... It's also the, it, it, it's unbiased, but it's also the feeling that there is something that makes sense mm-hmm. somewhere, and you don't have to do it. Because a lot of what's happening with people, I think in general, and something like maybe with the internet, is that we're running around trying to make sense of everything, yeah. which is like a game. I mean, you're never going to catch up to the making sense it's of It's what life. our brains are trained to yeah. do to keep us alive. Yeah. yeah, but it's a very hamster wheel kind of running through the maze problem. And so when you realize that what makes sense happens without you and without all of your conscious control it's really a relief and it's actually some of the moments when i feel like the anxiety um for patients goes down but couldn't have people argued that you trying to find sense in it is the exact same thing when you're trying to find sense in random events that are happening to you exactly like um okay i had a dream a couple nights ago that had like my ex-girlfriend in it right Mm -hmm. now we could talk about okay what does that unconsciously mean or it could at the same time i could argue i was talking to one of my friends about how i had an issue with her a week and a half ago and then at night my brain is trying to deal with all the different it's trying to re um not consolidate but take all of the experiences mm-hmm. and then run through them to see if it's mm-hmm. worth it to keep them in memory or not, or maybe something happened and you want to learn a skill. Oh, this is like the um, the the washing machine version of dream, like understanding dreams, like your, your mind is like kind of washing everything. Potentially, you're like, uh, there's this Dr. Matthew Walker, uh-huh. who you wrote a, a book about sleep, I think it came out like a year ago. And in it, he talks about how when we're trying to learn a new skill, the guitar, like anything, any new skill, if you are practicing during the day, they can look at the different brain patterns and brain waves and see the specific um, ner- neurons and just the, the wave of mm-hmm. when you're doing a certain high kick in, uh, let's say, some kind of martial art. And then you go to sleep. And if they record the brain patterns, they could find that exact same brain pattern being repeated at 40 times speed right. as your brain is trying to consolidate it and learn it quicker, which is which people have proven that mm-hmm. if you read something and try to learn it and then go to sleep, your retention rate is astronomically higher. Right. So that would kind of seem like it's mm-hmm. not the washer machine, but the, I don't know how to put it, like, like, a, like a computer running a program right. to try and, yeah, put it in the RAM, <laughs> memorize it, and then... Um, make it like concrete right you know i mean the one of the things that freud did that's really stunning in the interpretation of dreams is show the mechanisms by which the mind puts all of the things together which obviously include what he called day residue which is the stuff that happened during the day Mm -hmm. so it's not just you know like yes the dream actually picks things from recent memory but it's the way that it combines them that's actually the most interesting because it shows something about the logical thought processes and what the mind, like how the mind is trying to consolidate the information and around what themes and what it's picking. Um, and, you know, often like it, what's fascinating is when you realize that, like, you know, your attention was, I'm you know, on you. Mm-hmm. But it was this other thing. Like, I noticed that sticker. That got yeah. stuck in my mind. And that connects to something else that's more important in the background. And the mind is picking those things and putting them together in the dream in, like, an ingenious way. Oh. Okay. And it's also the, like, kind of poetic, artistic elements that actually become the most important because you're getting to know the way that you think without thinking and every like you know people have a certain style like one of the things i get to know when i have patients is like you know i i i I can feel them in their dreams i kind of understand the way that their mind works by the way that they do certain things in their you know in their dream life like your dreams do not look the same as 
Z's dreams. Yes. And, you know, and so on and so forth. Different paradigms, how you think about things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And people are so smart in their <laughs> dream life <laughs> more than they are in person. I mean, none of us are very smart in person. When you talk about yourself, you're an idiot. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so it's like that. It's that you get to know this other part of your mind. I mean, Freud said everyone's a genius in their own conscience, which is really true. I mean, it's it's... I marvel at it. It's kind of like that gut feeling. Like, yeah. you know, a lot of times trying to follow that, yeah. which I've tried to tap into more, yeah. which is like when you feel something just going with it, which I guess could be... Sub- like, do you do you ever have moments during your day where you're like, oh, my, that's an unconscious thing that came up, or that's... Uh, like, are you aware of it, or is it more... I mean, certainly as an analyst, you're working with your own unconscious in order to um, listen to your patients. So in a certain way, you're trying to shut down the typical sense-making, conscious ways of thinking so that you can listen behind their speech. Because the more you try to make sense of what someone's saying, especially when they're rambling, you're just going to exhaust yourself, and it's not very helpful. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to hear things that are off-center. You're trying to hear something funny that happens, like, you know, in terms of the speech, something that disrupts it or seems a little off in order to kind of pinpoint that area. Okay. And so I have an experience of this all the time. You know, like, I mean, I just have a hunch about something. I heard something strange, and I said, you know, can you go back to that and tell me a little bit more about it? And, of course, it ends up often, not all the time, but often, you know, it opens up a whole new thing that the person didn't expect to come speak about, you know, and you go like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it, I do think it's fascinating how all these different urges and things about people that they try and, I, I know like f- f- people like to say that Freud was, you know, misogynistic, but his, um, his words are like if he, like they're in our culture and the oh, way yeah. we speak all the time. Yeah, all everyone talks words. about ego. Everyone talks about edible complex. People don't usually talk about super ego, but they talk about id. Yeah, and then libido as well. Yeah. Uh, do you find they, that they people talk about repression? They talk about defenses. I mean, all okay. the, all the language is there. Is from Freud. But I think that that's also very psychoanalytic, the fact that we consciously repudiate him and at the same time absorb the information, which is fine. I don't really, which is why I don't really care if people hate Freud. Oh, uh, okay. Because you're like, I've seen the, <laughs> like, I've, I've seen it work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I see everyone. paying attention to it anyways. I mean, also, you know, people, what people don't realize, sorry, I, I was away from the microphone, um, is that Freud had like a huge indictment, one of the um, the ways in which we treat sex and sexuality i mean he was pro homosexuality in like 19 when in 1905 you know he said Jeez. he said homosexuality has been around a long time it's totally natural he said that all humans were bisexual he had an indictment against male sexuality he said that um you know men have a tendency towards debasement in the sphere of okay, love okay i read that in the i wanted to uh, bring that up yeah yeah um, he said that monogamy seems the demand that someone find full satisfaction in a monogamous relationship seemed insane to him, given what he understood about sexuality. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think he was pretty forward. Pretty progressive. Yeah. 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 I don't know why he's been lambasted in our they don't, society. For people get upset about the penis envy thing. It makes them really upset. But I don't think that he said, I, you know, in the way that I read him, I don't think he said that like women have penis envy. I think he meant everybody has penis envy. Okay, how so? Meaning we always think that the other person's got the bigger, bigger better dick. shit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we always think that we're missing something, you know, like that the other person envy could, has. Could be a metaphor to just like, f- just envy. Just envy. FOMO and, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay, so people were like, oh, he's and trying to And an obsession see. with who we imagine has the power, which by the time, at the time that he was writing, women had no power. Zero power. Zero yeah. power. And so... Obviously, penis envy could mean not just having a dick, but being a man who could be successful in the world yes. compared to a woman who was looked at as other. Right. Yeah. I mean, at that point, they couldn't even vote in America. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, I remember learning about. What are you? Because I remember learning about ed- the edible, edible complex mm-hmm. and I'm just like. <laughs> The wow. women that I go for are nowhere near my mom. And I'm not just disp- like, 
I can't dispel it, but I'm not discrediting it. Mm -hmm. I just go, oh, that's interesting. I'll accept that that could be a possibility. But then when I look forward in my life, I go, eh, maybe not. And I actually consciously go, if a, if a woman reminds me of my mom, I'm like, I already have enough of that. Like, I don't need to. <laughs> right. So I think maybe people might be but averse then, to it. But then your mom is still the model, even if she's the anti-model. Yeah, she's the anti-model. But that's still a model somewhere. So the point for him was just the importance of the love that we, the the desire and love that we experience very intensely as children towards mm-hmm. our, our parents. Yes. And that we also hate them. So, you know, I mean, in a way he said, okay, so boys want to sleep with their mothers and kill their fathers for being obstacles in the way of them sleeping with their mothers. But, I mean, I think you could look at it as just the intensity of those experiences that we had towards our parents when we were young, which no one wanted to recognize. I mean, I remember my son, when he was very little at one point, um, you know, he would just, when he was in his Oedipal phase, he was Mm -hmm. like psychotic. He would just look at me and be like, you're so beautiful, mommy. You're so soft. Like, you know, it was just, there's like this real intensity. I'm obsessed with you. And the idea is that that intense, and then it goes away. I mean, that's what's also crazy is that like it, it, for Freud, he says, you know, there's there's this moment of this real intensity, the question of like, what are your parents doing and why do they get to sleep together at night and I have to go to bed all alone? What are they doing in there? What does it mean to be married? That the kids have this intensity of this question that they're asking about what what made them, what do their parents do, what are these genitals for, what is mm-hmm. sexual pleasure, that they really have these questions and then they vanish. And that, so Freud said that the Oedipus complex leads to repression, a repression of early sexuality, and then the kid enters into, like, childhood at that point, at which you're not so obsessed with this stuff. Okay. And, you know, universally we recognize that kids after age six can then kind of go to school and sit down. Before that, we can't really make them sit down in school because they're so intense. Yeah, and, they're in- um, and so it matches up to a certain extent with the way that development works. Okay. Um, and also the moment in which you turn away from your parents, you know, you, you separate from them in some real extreme fashion, but right before that is a real intensity of feeling. And that intensity is somewhere in your choice of love objects later in life, whether it's that you don't ever want to be with a woman like your mother or whether you keep ending up with women sort of like your mother or with certain traits or whatever it would be. Is that it's it's in there somewhere? Um, I'm always with men like my father. Yeah. Yeah. You found that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have to fight them in exactly the same way. It's terrible for them. <laughs> I'm sorry. But you've had practice, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> with your own dad. <laughs> yeah. I guess people don't want to accept it because they think that means I want to fuck my mom, and mm-hmm. that's gross to think right. that like. I think to them it means, oh, if if Freud is true, then I'm having fantasies about my mom. Right. When in reality, I, I, as far as I'm understanding it, it's more your mother was the first f- opposite sex in your life. Mm-hmm. It, she brought you into this world. She gave you unconditional love. It almost makes perfect sense that that, that, that is what the first you would... body that you have so much proximity to? Yes. Yeah. First, you know, yeah. It would almost make sense that that's who you shape... And model who you'd want to be with later on in life. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean you want to be with her. Right. But people equate that that's what it means. Right. Which it's necessarily not. But you you did want to be with her. Do you remember how, you know, for kids remember how hard it was to go to preschool or whatever and screaming and like, you know, they wanted their, they didn't want, and by the way, it can be, you can, your love object could be your father. I mean, it, Mm -hmm. you know, it it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The idea is that there's, there's an intensity there that, um, that's, that's in your, it's, it's in your unconscious. In your unconscious, not in your conscious. (laughs) Not in your conscious. But then maybe you'll notice who you choose later on if they're more Mm -hmm. like that or not. I guess I'll have to reflect on the women I've been with and see. I can see parts of it, but not... I don't know. Part of me sometimes thinks we we overanalyze ourselves and yeah. try to make sense of all of this in reality. Like we, Not that we'll never know, but I don't want to make this comparison because I think like psychoanalysis and 
psychotherapy and all of that is much realer Mm -hmm. and more proven. But I look at it as trying to like um, look through the tea leaves and like, you know, make a prediction when reality, like maybe they're just leaves, you Mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of people feel like that. And and then because then you just go, okay, am I going to analyze every single thing that I've ever fucking done? (laughs) You know what I mean? It can go to analysis paralysis, which is I something that I experience Mm -hmm. because then I go, I have to I have to find every single which way this can go and then try and figure out whether it's going to work or not. Right. And then then I'll make a decision. Right. You know? I mean, hopefully when one is in analysis, you get them out of that position of over analyzing themselves because it's not, I mean, you realize pretty quickly, hopefully in analysis that it's a, it's about the process. It's not about you taking everything apart with your mind, but that you, you really give yourself over to this process of trying to speak as freely as possible and pay attention to the little things that happen from a dream to an unexpected thought. And then you bring it to the analyst and and you speak it. So, you know, we all overthink things too much, but analysis tries to get you away from that because we see it as fundamentally defensive, basically. You know? Overthinking. Yeah, or just thinking. <laughs> it's defensive. Thinking is defensive. It's just a, it's just trying to get control. So analysis hopefully helps you um, be a little more open. Open and yeah, less less controlling. Okay. So Freud thought everyone was bisexual. Yes. But so he probably would have agreed with the Kinsian, right? The, the scale? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He probably would have agreed with that to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, they loved Freud. The, yeah. Those guys. Yeah. Those guys. Um, what do you think about the, uh, I would say, exponential uptick in stepmom, like stepfather pornography? And what has that said to you about where we are as a society right now? But I did this with um, a friend of mine. We just did, he does this magazine called Apology. Mm -hmm. His name is Jesse Pearson. And we did this whole thing on fantasy. And I forget, he looked it up. We did like a little interview with each other. And and Pornhub, like the top five were were like siblings, step parents. Step mom, step sister. Yeah, yeah. Milf. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. So it's all family. It's all in the family. How mm-hmm. can you deny the Oedipus complex? Yeah, if you're when seeing that, that if that's what people on. are looking Come for. On. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. When I when <laughs> when I, I I stopped looking at pornography about a year ago. Also when of, it's like all like it's all, you know, superior like the boss, the policeman, the teacher. I mean these are also parentally, you know, substitutes. Do you think Okay, because that brings up – sometimes people like to say that sex is a power dynamic and that it's all about power in mm-hmm. it. And I disagree with that because I've never been intimate with someone and been thinking I want to be in control. Like it's never gotten me more aroused like, yes, I'm in control. But do you do – you, Prescribe to that thinking that it's a power dynamic? That it's about power. Yeah. Um, for some people, I think it's about okay. power. Because <laughs> <All right. laughs> people try to present it as like, that's just what it is. Oh, like that's what it is? Exactly. Like no. it's a power. But, it, you know. Because you're bringing up these figures right. of, you know, teacher, student, stuff like that. The, the, these are different stakes or different levels of where they're at. Right. Which is very much power. Yeah, I mean, that would be a kind of eatable fantasy, which would probably involve some dimension of power, but there are many, many others, and they don't necessarily need to be about power. Um, you know, and probably psychoanalysis thinks that sexuality and power should be decoupled from one another because it's 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 not going to lead to, you know, it's a pretty, like, one-off fantasy. It's pretty boring after a while. So we hope that people have much more diverse sexual lives. Yes. <laughs> All the stuff. What did Freud say about, um, or more importantly, because I know you pres- like you like Freud, but I'm more interested in. It's been a hundred years since yeah. Freud, so yeah. maybe you've yeah. created your own uh, thoughts. And what are your thoughts on the, ma- like as his theory on the male tendency towards debasement? Because uh-huh. when I read that, and I thought about 
me and my own experiences and dudes that I've talked to, I was like, that's pretty true to a certain extent. And you feel guilty, but also confused. Do you think there's anything about, like, what do you think is leading towards that? Do you think it's society or what are your thoughts on it? Well, I can tell you what Freud said, and then we can like kind of try to chase it up into the contemporary. <laughs> Although you're mm-hmm. also saying that he, when he said it uh, all those years ago, I guess the paper was 1911, that it's still yeah. true, which I think is right. So it's the universal tendency towards debasement in the yes. sphere of love. And he said that men, um, in order to feel the freest sexually, need to be with a debased object or need to debase the person that they're with in some in some way. And he said that this was a problem with the fact that they haven't come to terms with their incestuous fantasies. So that the woman that Uh, they love is idealized, and that's mom. mm -hmm. But mom's not sexual, and you don't want to have sexual fantasies about your beautiful, lovely, loved, idealized mother who's not sexual at all. And so sexuality has been cordoned off into this, this domain, and this is what helps them know that it's not mom. <laughs> oh, okay. It's my, it's my whorish girlfriend that <laughs> excites me so much that's not like my mom, but the problem is I can't love her because I, I have to debase her so much. Um, so then men end, end up, he says, in a conundrum, which is the splitting of love and desire. So the one, once they're with a woman that they love, they don't sexually desire her anymore, and the one who they sexually desire, they can't love. And this sucks for you guys. It sucks for anybody that happens to you. It happens to women as well. So we're going to be ecumenical here. Yes. Yes. But also... Um, but, but for men a lot. Um, I'd and, say I, the majority. and I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's true. So he says that you guys have to deal with your incest fantasies. You issues. think by dealing with... <laughs> then you go, oh, okay, I can no, not, not un- treat this girl like a slut. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, if that was the case, um, mm-hmm. then it would be easy. But it's not. You have to go into analysis and you have to like make friends uh, with your unconscious and you got to do the whole stupid thing and like this stuff will get better because of that. It's not just knowing, unfortunately. Why do you think women don't have it as much as men? Um, the thing... The the crazy answer for Freud was that the the woman so the ma- the man starts with mom mm-hmm. primary object and then moves to dad to be a man like dad yes. and that he says that that move is very split right because you just like oh okay I'm like I'm gonna be a man I'm gonna be a dad I'm, I'm gonna get over this mom thing and so that the the mom thing gets really pushed down the girl starts with mom then goes to dad then has to go back to mom in order to, to be fun, a woman to be a woman and that that gives her more flexibility and this like added move um means that her her sexual fantasies are more variegated which is actually really true in my experience variegated yeah like there's just like there's you know like women are more fluid there oh yeah no no, no. that's <laughs> definitely more true and something as a guy i'm like not that I want it. I'm jealous that you guys are just more. It's just more accepted that women. It's like what? Yeah, whatever it is. Like it's yeah. just. It's very much more open. And guys are. We all. I think we all feel the pressure to be like. I'm a, like. This is what I am. Yeah. I'm just one thing. Right. This is like defined, definitive. Right. Not no nuance, but I think with sexuality, there's men don't like to have nuance. Yeah. Most of the time, whereas women are like. Yeah, she's she's cute. Like, maybe I would have sex with her, or maybe not. And guys, it's like, nah, just girls. Right. Or gay guys, I think it's a little bit different. They, like, but a lot of the gay guys that I know, it's like, I knew immediately I've one had nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so you think it's because going back and forth. Yeah, and I mean, this is also, you know, kind of what Freud's saying is that the the cultural stereotypes don't help. So the more that we have different images, you know, that like being a man doesn't mean like being a man and repudiating women. You got to get away from women and make sure you're on like the male side in order to feel like a male. But then like shit, you have to have sex with a woman and then it gets all screwed up again. Like, you know, the, it, the society can help, actually, I think this process be more open for for everybody. Um you know, so even though he's saying that developmentally, um, and you know, and also by the way, both parents participating in childcare also makes the kind of focus on the mother as the f- 
the primary object less um, intense, which is, would be helpful for us. It's not just oh, like okay. all mom all the time. Yeah. So you have two parents helping out. It's not just, yeah, focused on mom the entire time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I just remember when I read the debasement thing, I was like, damn, that is... Even if... And e- pornography. I mean, it's just all pornography... A lot of pornography, 90% of pornography is just debasement. Fantasies. But do you think that's just because porn feels, or sex is, feels bad and dirty and it should, people want it to feel like, I mean, this could, wrong, which then we could talk about why do people want it to feel wrong, but because of that, you want it to be free and kind of gross like that? I mean, from my perspective, sex mm-hmm. can be... It's everything, so it can be anything. It's the place where possibility is opened up. So why mm-hmm. is pornography so repetitive and like limited in scope? I find bizarre because it's like, you know, you we should be able to invent all kinds of sexual fantasies. I mean, I you know, probably there's more out there than I understand and I have to hear from my patients that they're like on the search for more interesting porn. Yeah. Um, and so maybe there's stuff is being made, but I mean the kind of standard pornography is really boring. It's like pretty limited stuff. It's the same yeah. kind of on her face. I don't know, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, you, yeah, no, go on first. Yeah, that happens. It's, it's usually the end. Yeah, right. exactly. The money shot. Yeah, right. what everyone fast forwards to. Yeah. yeah. But then now they're, yeah, they get to, I mean, there's so much out there that, that people people can search for anything, which I think is, is um, I would say great. I'm a, I, I want everyone, everyone to, to do whatever they want. But I think you had talked about this for people listening, the article that I, where I found Jam- uh, Dr. Webster was um, Jameson. Jameson. Um, uh, that's my upbringing. Uh, is um, the psychopharmacology of everyday life, right? Mm-hmm. Which I realized after reading it was based on the title "The Psychopathology of Everyday Life" by Freud. Mm-hmm. Which, if I tried to read, would probably explode my head. <laughs> but uh, you very excessively. And interestingly, break down, I think, six major drugs that we're all on, mm-hmm. antidepressants, benzodiazepines, sleeping pills, sex pills. Uh, and stimulants. Stimulants. ADHD drugs. ADHD, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I believe in it you talked about um, porn leading towards this, like, it's it's being able to have no full control over the situation Mm -hmm. and which is not what sex is Mm -hmm. and which leads to like a false sense of security so then when you're actually having sex Mm -hmm. you feel anxiety and you feel out of control which can lead to uh, performance issues Mm -hmm. which i found very like pertinent because i've had that for basically since i came online as a teenager Mm -hmm. And that's why I stopped about like 11 months ago, trying mm-hmm. to see if that would happen. But I feel like a, many guys are probably experiencing this. I, I don't know if it's the same with women, but with guys where it's like you're fully in control. You get to see, you get to imagine it, but you don't have to worry about like someone else being there. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about their pleasure either, which is often really confusing for men. Like my yes. pleasure, her pleasure. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah we, we all of us need to learn a little bit more <laughs> so about hard. that. Yes, yeah. I mean, it is, but also like you can talk and ask, ask yeah. people things and read books. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's these societies that are developing online where like men are trying to support each other to stop jerking off to pornography and yeah. they're like support groups. And no fapping. No nut November. No yeah. nut November. That's what we're in right oh, now. Oh, we're in now. We're Great. in no nut November. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it must be it must be terrible. It must be like an epidemic. I don't, you know, I don't, I can't see that many patients. So I only have like a small yeah. like N, but you know, yeah. Again, it just it's interesting to me that like dudes are having that problem, yeah. but I, I feel like, at least from what I've experienced, women aren't experiencing it as much at all, even though they're all watching. Well, there's this thing that you're not allowed to talk about, which is the difference between the clitoral and vaginal orgasm, because like a Mm -hmm. long time ago, the psychoanalysts were all like, you know, the vaginal orgasm is the real orgasm. And then feminists were like, screw you for saying that there's like a real one and a fake one. Um, 
and you know, I I think that like the like all the pleasures, you know, like of the body are very important. You know, that you like it's very like we lose our sensuality very quickly. Um, I mean, certainly anxiety destroys it and overindulgence destroys it and just general repression destroys it. I mean, we're all like trying to learn to be body conscious again. You know, a lot of what we're doing in yoga is like, you know, get in touch with your body. But I I just I have this feeling and part of the reason I wrote the article was because it's like every no one no one knows what it means to have a body anymore. And then we're medicating like, you know, just that the body now is something that we medicate, that we like streamline in gyms, that we, you know, submit to these wellness routines. Mm Um, and, but it's not working, you know, like everyone who comes to me is complaining that they have symptoms, that their sex lives are bottoming out, you know, that it's just not like working the way it's supposed to. So what do we have to do in order to get in touch with our bodies again? Um, that's why I wrote the last book. Cause it was about the fact that like, you know, Freud started with this idea of conversion, which was the way in which we transfer psyche into the body, sometimes by numbing the body. It's not just that the body could, like, could be in pain or have a certain kind of symptom or a tick or a rigidity or whatever the kinds of things he was seeing, but he was also mm-hmm. seeing numbness. Really? Yeah. As a symptom of? A psychical, as a psychological symptom. A psychosomatic thing. Yeah. It's causing numbness because they don't want to deal with an issue. Yeah. You don't want to feel. God. <laughs> My fucking brain is so much it's so powerful why are we so obsessed with being meffed up why are we obsessed with caffeine pro- productivity like this is gonna boost it right. like uh, ev- like everything is caffeine in it now everything and if Adderall was not a controlled substance everything would have m- like that form of methamphetamine I think it's like methamphetamine salts or whatever it is yeah um why are we so obsessed with it? I think America specifically, more than any other nation. I mean, I, you know, I have a kind of Marxist point of view on this and then like a psychoanalytic one. I think capitalism is at a point where it's reached so far into every crevice of life. The idea is that if you're not making money, you're not, you're like worthless. You know, so like we don't, we don't care about leisure time at all, mm-hmm. you know. Um, like people can't figure out how to take breaks anymore. I mean, one of the things I see in my patients is that like, like people don't, some people don't go on vacation at all. And like the minute that they're not in their 24 seven productivity cycle, they break out in horrendous anxiety. They're just terrified of themselves, their life, whatever, so that they're in this. And it's part of the ethos that we have at this point. Um, time is money. Mm-hmm. which means that all your time has to be spent productively, which means and none of us can do that. Things like dreaming and sleeping and fucking and all these things like aren't really you know, <laughs> going to make you a huge amount of money. And so yeah. we're like wiping them, we're wiping them out. And what we're doing instead is taking Adderall, or, you know. Um, and Adderall is amazing because, you, you know, <laughs> when I was on a college campus, everybody was on Adderall. Um, we, you know, you found someone with a prescription, you went and got a prescription, everyone was taking this. And so yeah. you just, you know, you, it, you concentrate and you're in a megalomaniac state. You, what you're doing, you think is great. It's probably not that great, but That's you, what you I think, think it's great. That's what I think is, cause I remember they did, they, they've studied like whether you get that much more done. And I think they found that not really, no. but you feel great while you're doing it. Right which makes you want to continue doing it. Right. Which, you know, when you do anything, it doesn't feel very good. You feel like you suck most of the time. Yeah. And I think that we have zero tolerance for that. For <laughs> more and more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you know, like when I watch little kids learn to write, it's so hard. Their little hands and like holding the pencil and making mm-hmm. those stupid lines on the paper. And like the patience that you have to have with your child when you're like teaching them to do this, um, we don't, you know, we grow up and we think that to feel like that is just awful, you know, to have to take that time to get it right and like in the frustration and feeling bad and feeling incompetent and feeling like your muscles don't work or you don't know how to train them to get there. Um, You know, and I think also probably a lot of experiences that people are having as kids is that, you know, we don't probably the parents didn't like it either because we have this idea that we should just be able to do things. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think we have that idea? 
I, I mean, I, I don't know whether it's particularly American, but I mean, at this point in society, the failure is very scary because it means like no health care. It means like you're going to fall off the edge of the map. There's no net mm -hmm. and we don't have communities anymore. You know, so it's not like you're like, oh, my, you know, my friends will take care of me. Like, no, you feel like you could just fall into like outer space if you fail. Um, so the price of success is huge. And then also the images of success are, are wild at this point. I mean, you know, whatever, like the Kardashians or whatever it means to be famous. Like everyone has to be famous. Yeah. It didn't used to be the expectation. I think it also didn't used to be a possibility. Sure. And now it's like. It's most likely not going to happen, but you do have something that like this. I could do right. a lot on this and then potentially get validation from mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people and feel important in a world where a lot of times it's easy to feel unimportant. Right. Right. Think but, but, you know, when did we get this idea that, like, we needed recognition and we needed importance and, you know... <laughs> no, you're right, yeah. Same crazy, yeah. Yeah, I don't... I'm not sure what's led to it, but I, f I mean, I feel it. Um, the generation that's... I'm lucky, I think. What's your generation? I'm, millenn I'm a millennial. You're a millennial. Yes. Okay. So we've got our all our own shit, but the generation below me, the ones that are, like, in their teens right now, yeah. I think that they're even worse off in terms <laughs> of, just in terms of trying to be, quote, unquote, fit. like, there's this tick, there's TikTok now, and I, I'm on it, and I'm, like, scrolling through, and I'm seeing kids, like getting fired from their jobs to make videos, uh, doing fucked up shit to their friends or their family members because and being like, please don't let this flop. Like, please make me famous. And putting that in the title. And then I'm just thinking like, I mean, when I was in high school, we didn't have, we had Facebook. Mm -hmm. We didn't have Instagram really. Mm -hmm. There was no desire to be famous on like whatever maybe you posted a good picture i think the like button was incorporated my senior year right you know or my, my freshman year of college and it was also you were connecting with friends you weren't yes. trying to broadcast yourself to strangers yeah that's the biggest is that and i think it's a lot of it's happened without us realizing it's happening right but it used to be i went to a party one night and then you would take a bunch of pictures and then you would post them to be like, oh, th these are like funny pictures. And then someone would comment, oh, you were such an idiot, blah, blah, blah. And it was about connecting. Mm -hmm. And then I'm not sure when, but now it's not about connecting. Mm -hmm. It's where do, what photo do I look the best in? Where do I, where do I come off as the best version of me? And is there something that I can post that will make me go viral mm -hmm. and will make more people find out about me? to take me to an end i'm not even sure what it is right but but that i think is going to make me feel more secure <laughs> which like it's not going to there's no way there's no way there's no i mean the more i've gotten into it the more i guess you could say insecure i've gotten mm -hmm. i'm not, i'm not i don't actually feel that i've gotten more insecure but more insecure involved with the app because then, instead of being like, this is just something I want to post, now it's like, we're a society of metrics. Right. Like, how many comments? How many, like, let me compare it to other ones. Let me compare, like, it, it's becoming now that your entire life is just, I have a graph of how my life is literally going. And I can look. And then if three right. months, if it's sloping down, I'm failing the fourth quarter uh, meeting with all the investors, which is just my brain, is happening. How am I going to boost revenue? And it's like this. It's like we're come on. I guess we're commoditizing. I don't know the word ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think it's horrible for us. I think it's really bad. I think it's bad news. Have you know? I feel like I mean you've been doing this for twenty years, right? Mm -hmm. So have you noticed an uptick in 
anxiety or do you think there's been an uptick in just people talking about it? I think there's a, I think there's an uptick in anxiety Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I mean, even with the whole Trump situation, it's, it's like so much worse. Um, I must find like my days a lot more intolerable than I used to remember them being because I have to just kind of, you know, deal with so much anxiety, which is the, mm-hmm. the least fun part of my job. When someone's anxious, then they can't, they're not in the flow. That's very hard for them to speak. You know, you're trying to manage their anxiety or wedge them into a place where they can get out of it, which isn't the most fun part. It's mm-hmm. like when they're not in it, which is what's great. Yeah. Um, so I've been, I, I feel like burnt out from my job because of the anxiety more than I used to. Um, so I do think it's worse. The other thing is that um, the, I, what generation would it be? I guess it's Z at this point. Like I, I see kids, so um, I see like suicidal preteens and teens, which mm-hmm. like so many of them. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, I, and I've been, if you look at the statistics, suicides are up, like I forget, it's like something like, it's massive. And it's up for women in particular. Um, in the, in the 14 to 20 year old range for, for girls, it's up like 60%. Um, so I, uh, on the one hand, I think there's a lot of anxiety and the other hand, I think there's a lot of suicidality. Like people actually, yeah. Yeah. And the, the little girls I've seen, I was talking with a colleague about this. What is strange is that one, their puberty is kind of happening earlier, like, the girls are getting their periods earlier. I don't know why. I mean, people have all these theories about it. But, mm-hmm. like, you know, so it's happening at 9 or 10. And it is a strange reality that you have to deal with as a oh, little shit. girl. But it's puberty. Like fourth grade. Yeah. yeah, it's really early. But it's not that that's the problem. It's the problem that what what having to imagine yourself as a woman who can have a baby yeah. means that you need an image of what it means to be a woman available to you. And these little girls that I'm seeing that are suicidal don't have an image of what it means to grow up and be a woman that they that feels good to them. I don't know if it's the pornography. I don't know if it's the debate in society about how terrible men are. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's, you know, that their mothers are struggling in different ways and they've had to watch that in combination with those other things. But they literally don't have that image. And then they collapse, and the place that they collapse is into this suicidality. And then a lot of the little girls are talking to each other about being suicidal, and they're supporting each other in it. They're like, oh, I'm suicidal. And then they're like, yeah, I'm suicidal. And that becomes this kind of hysterical wildfire amongst little girls. And then often one of them commits suicide, unfortunately. I mean, there's that fucking show, 13 Reasons Why. Right. Like, I about. I don't know what this is. Oh, it's a, this, it's this show on Netflix where it's. I didn't watch it because uh-huh. I was like, I don't need to watch a show about a girl killing herself. Like, that's just not what life's hard enough. Right. Like, I live in New York City. I, I am good. Yeah. But apparently it's a good show. Um, it's about this woman or girl who in high school who kills herself and she leaves 13 videos and gives 13 reasons why she did it. Right. And sometimes like calls people out and said mm-hmm. like on this day, like and, and it kind of plays back via 10 episodes, those 13 reasons and how it led to her then eventually killing herself. And when I heard that, I was like, that's really shitty of her to do to all those people that are now alive. So, I mean, I don't know if I want to call suicide like a narcissistic thing to do Mm -hmm. because I have a lot of empathy and sympathy for people that are in that place. But that seems like a pretty narcissistic thing to do. But at the same time, I'm like, is well, this Freud, helping? Freud always said that suicide was homicide. I mean, one, because you're you're killing the hated part of yourself, but you're also mm-hmm. directing the suicide at the people around you. That it's a it's like a it's a homicidal impulse turned inwards. By killing yourself, you're hurting the people. Yeah. You're hurting a lot of people around you. And the the biggest predictor for someone when I worked in the hospital, the only thing that we have, it's not like, you know, how X or Y or Z are they. Um, but whether someone in their family has committed suicide, they're like 200% times more likely to, to, to do it. So suicide breeds suicide, um, which is what's terrible about it. 
Um, you know, maybe just because it opens the gate to the fact that someone can take your life and you have to imagine it and it's in your family and so on and so forth. It makes it more possible somehow. But um, no, suicide breeds suicide. And I also think of the opioid deaths. I think most of them are probably some form of suicide. Suicide? You think just depression leading towards... Because I remember when I was reading in the article, you, you were saying opioids is... Um, it's leading to this sleep, to this... Uh, separation from pain pain from the rest of the world Mm -hmm. and the ultimate pain is technically living Mm -hmm. like living is hard it's very painful (laughs) even when you have a great day like i I had a good day today but it's still still parts of it that suck Mm -hmm. yeah and you're still like always trying to figure out what to do someone sent me an email today that said hope life is treating you well i said life doesn't treat anyone well yeah life treats no one well (laughs) but we do that because we know how much it sucks you know but yeah but you're right you're like life treats no one well what are you saying like yeah yeah it's like when someone told me to they're like have a good day at work and i was like fuck off like i'm that's not gonna happen like i don't right but i think despite that you can then choose to either be positive and grateful to have it or I guess to go down the route of no pain no function I don't remember if you had uh, postulated that it was like a ultimate narcissism to remove yourself from the rest of the world mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right with the the medication yeah yeah no Freud said that you know like pain especially makes us narcissistic because you're you're just focusing on your own stuff you mm-hmm. know your your pain essentially he had that quote from the poet um narrow was his soul in his uh mole molar it was like a it was like a, a, a funny oh yeah talking from, about talking about the poet who um who has a tooth ache <laughs> are you gonna look for it yeah Concentrated in, in his soul, in his molars, in mo- molars narrow hole. Yeah. William Bush. There you go. William He's suffering Bush. from a, a narcissistic withdrawal of the libido onto the subject's own self. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. What do you. When the, the opiate epidemic was happening, did. And you like, were like, oh shit, all these people are dying. Did something stick out to you as like, this is potentially leading to because people have always been unhappy for as long as people have been alive and conscious we've been unhappy and yes it hasn't been as easy to get your hands on drugs but in other times you were still able to get drugs and alcohol and then no but come on in this country you're right the fact that you can get your hands on guns Yes. And the fact that you can get your hands on really, really powerful... All the, yes, definitely uncontrol- helps. Like, the, the fentanyl, like, is very... Well, fentanyl, the fact that it was, is insane. It's insane. Because it can, it's so easily can kill you. Yeah. And was put into all the... I mean, if I want to get a prescription of, like, 80 Vicodin, mm-hmm. I can go see my doctor and tell him that I have, like, chronic back pain and I will have all of those pills. Yes. I mean, you, you, that would have been much harder. It would have been harder, but it seemed to me that one big part of it was the pharma companies pushing it. Sure. But I'm still curious if it's a product of what's going on that's leading us to... To do this. To doing it. Well, I do think we're in a very precarious... People feel very precarious right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people feel really lost. So, I mean, part of what I'm saying about these little girls is, like, in a moment in which it's just the normal passage of going from girl to woman, it's like their entire psychic system is collapsing. If that's happening for lots of little girls, it's happening on many levels for everybody. Um, You know, people feel more isolated than ever, even though they're more connected Connected, in this whole, like, kind of discussion. And then we allow them to get near guns and drugs. Yes. Like, I, you know, I think we're in, like, a a storm. And this is what Joker is about. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what this movie is about, is that we are letting people fall through the cracks, which we are. um, Definitely. And uh, people are, and they're going to, they're going to want to commit violence against themselves or against other people. That's just what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I agree. That's people get 
depressed enough and uh, feel lonely enough and outcast enough that they go like, "What's the point?" Mm-hmm. Everyone's. Uh, I mean, you just become defensive and you go, "Everyone's against." Like, I want to cause pain. The like the amount that I've felt, mm-hmm. which is so evil and so sad at the same time to where you you can like feel you can i think that's what is one of the points of that movie that you like i left it going that's not a good guy but i still understand and feel like what to a certain extent how he feels and that makes me scared and also realize that like we can all understand what different like people are going through. No, I mean that line is incredible when he um he says, What do you get? It's like his joke on when he's on the T V show, what do you get when you have a, a a mentally ill loner in a society who treats him like trash? You yeah. get what you deserve. It's terrifying. It's really it's really that's an incredible piece of writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I mean, and that was, you know, that was like a fundamental psychoanalytic truth was that we don't blame people for their mental health, like for mental health problems. Their mental health problems are a reasonable response to what they've been through. It doesn't mean that it's a, it's the best response, but it mm-hmm. is a reasonable response. And the point is for them to understand how they've come to suffer the way they do so that they can make different choices. But you need a lot of help at that place. Yeah. I mean, you know, for people who... um you know, and it was the true for me. I would have been completely lost if I hadn't gone to therapy. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had no idea about, um, like, what was wrong with me, what was going on, why I was so angry, why I was so upset, why I was so sick, why I was ruining every relationship I was in. I had no idea. I, I, and I, I didn't understand what happened to me. And then by going to it, it allowed you to understand, like, who you were. Yeah. And what was going on. Yeah. Or then, and to reorient myself somehow in my life differently. But Why do you, that takes so much work. It takes a lot of time. time. And and drug like as you point in the the drugs are easier. They're so much easier. When but when did the shift happen from trying to work it through with therapists who just throw drugs at it? Because th- I mean, to me, it's like every. I think I'm like one of one of the, the few people I know that isn't on antidepressants, bent like any of that stuff yeah. on. Number one, on purpose, because, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from the research that I've done and heard, antidepressants, they they definitely help some people. And they definitely help people that are going through harder, hard, like that are severely depressed. But for a lot of people, it just kind of mutes them. And then there are other, like, tactics or... Uh, things you could try to do that are just as helpful. Like mm-hmm. b- like people don't like to hear it because it, it sounds like you're calling them lazy, but if you're active every single day, that's going to help your brain produce endorphins and mm-hmm. just have a better outlook on life. Like certain things that you can do. So I remember when I learned that, I was like, I don't want to be on those because I've heard of all the negative things. Mm-hmm. But it's just accepted in our society as the thing to get thrown. You go to a, I could go to a doctor and they, he'd be like, here's some benzos and SSRIs, like mm-hmm. tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then I would just be half lobotomized. I mean, it, it's since they were invented, which was essentially, I mean, it really catches fire in the 80s. It starts in the, the 50s, but they, the first ones that they developed were, like, really bad. And then they figured out how to streamline them so that, you know, the, the, um, the side effects weren't as bad. But they all have side effects. I mean, uh, there isn't a single drug that doesn't have a host of side effects. Um, I also like I, I forget who said it uh, I think it was a doctor who was like when we shouldn't be even be calling them side effects they should just be called the effects of the drug because people the like drug. to go it's like true. oh here's the main one but it's like no no these are the effects <laughs> you're gonna said. feel a little less sad but you're also probably not gonna be able to potentially perform sexually and then, I don't know eat, like eat all these different things mm-hmm. sometimes more suicidal thoughts it's like insane yeah, it, it's amazing that they figured out that giving antidepressants to teenagers actually can make them suicidal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, as someone working with patients, if they're coming in on drugs, mm-hmm. um, do you let them know that you're working towards maybe not having them on them? Or 
Yeah, I mean, I get most people. I get. I mean, I think I hundred percent of my patients. I pretty much have off drugs, but there's a moment. I mean, if someone comes in and they're like adamant about the fact that they like their medication, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna take them on head on. So I have to wait for a moment when they're like, "Well, I don't know," and then you know I can say, "Okay, well, have you? You know, why have you not?" So I don't, you know, I don't want to beat anyone over the head with my basic framework, which is that it's better not to take psychopharmacological medications mm-hmm. if possible. But um, I do eventually try to get people off because my experience is, you know, when I've worked with someone who's been on antidepressants and then seen them off of it, their mind just isn't, I can't, it's like, I, I think I've said, I, I feel like I'm in a bell jar, you know, like, like mm-hmm. nothing goes up, nothing goes down. So I can't push any of the pieces around the board. It's just like spinning and neutral. Um, and so like, it's almost as if I can't do my job. Cause they're just mellowed out. They're, they're or just muted. They're just, they're not experiencing highs and they're not experiencing lows and you need to touch those places. You need mm-hmm. to touch those, uh, like that place where you feel both excited and depressed and the different things that are connected to those feeling states in order to push a patient along. <sighs> I mean, if you've if you're like you know if you've like cut off that range, then you've you've really cut off a lot of yourself. I feel like part of it is it's hard because I don't ever remember consciously going. You should be happy most of the time, mm-hmm. but for some reason, I think that's in most of us. That's true. It's yeah. some kind of innate understanding that like we should be happy. And we should feel good. The tyranny but of happiness. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It's most of the time, like, happiness, I think, is, is also a fleeting emotion. It's not something you can feel all the time. Like, you can feel content. You can feel mm-hmm. confident. Um, Freud shreds the idea of happiness in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents. It's a really say? beautiful chapter. I mean, he says, you know, like, isn't happiness just when you make unhappiness go away for a second? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so like, what does anyone think that they're trying to achieve and trying to achieve happiness? Yeah. But for some reason, it's in us. And because of that, I can say from my personal experiences, when I started to not feel okay, or to have those up and ups and downs, my first thought was, how do I run from that? Right. How do I get back to pot like positive feeling good Mm -hmm. and i i kind of feel like that's for whatever reason programmed into us instead of the the understanding that like life is pain Mm -hmm. in good and bad ways like you're gonna feel good some days and then you're just gonna feel bad and if you're not having both of those then it's not gonna be real but then at the same time you meet people that are like i'm positive every day and i envy that i i would like to no matter what's happening to me try to have i mean i have a pretty decent positive outlook sure but you look at those people and you're like they must feel fucking amazing like every single day but we as we valorize romantic relationships as a society i mean you know that it you know, <laughs> it's like pretty important you know in terms of a lot of the amount of time people spend thinking about you know whatever their boyfriend their boyfriend, girlfriend yeah, yeah okay um but it's not as if if you think about relationships, sure, there's intense pleasure and excitement, but it's also the when you feel the worst. That person can make you feel so terrible. And, you know, when you break up, it's the biggest pain. And so it's just funny to me that despite the fact that the whole ro- rom-com kind of aspect of our society mm-hmm. still wants to write pain out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or if there's pain, it's like, Five minutes of the movie. Right. It's like shit didn't go well. The girl's crying. The guy's standing in the rain trying to figure out what to do. And then some wise soul comes to or something happens that reminds him and he's like, I'm an idiot. I've been. And as much as I want to be like, I haven't been programmed by some of those movies. I feel like part mm-hmm. of me thinks like that. Oh, yeah. And so you, and then when you find that in yourself, you go, what the fuck is wrong with me? Right. Like, I, I found with myself recently that 
I've always I've been creating this like perfect um there's, what's the female equivalent of Adonis? You know what I mean? Like the perfect Aphrodite. Af- yeah, Aphrodite. <laughs> yeah, like this Aphrodite-etic woman that I'm like when I find her then I'll know and then I'll be good. It'll all be great. I'll, I'll figure it out and then and then <laughs> that's going to be what it is. And when I like finally, I don't know, when I finally said that out loud and real, I was like, that is so insane, <laughs> but I still believe it. Mm-hmm. Even after saying it, I'm mm-hmm. still like, yeah, but it like, or you know what, maybe not perfect, but I'll get closer than what that was. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's almost like this capitalistic, uh, I don't like knocking capitalism because I feel like it's made a lot of amazing things, sure. but it needs to at some point be... Um, not attenuated, but like uh, kind of reined in. Mm-hmm. It needs to be controlled to some point or else it'll lead to, I think, a lot of the sadness and like hyper productivity that we're getting to now. Um, but it is almost this capitalistic way of looking at your partner, which is like, how do I find the best? Like, oh, my girlfriend now, like if I had a girlfriend now, she'd be the iPhone 11. Mm-hmm. But in three years, I'm going to find the iPhone 12 x plus and i'm gonna be like well that fills even more my needs and i don't know i don't know if other people can relate to this i think they probably can but it's an insane thing for you to realize but then still play on it you know yeah yeah it's really hard not to do that the psychoanalyst esther perel who's got a podcast and Mm -hmm. she was just interviewed in the new yorker i mean she says these very basic but important things like like you know relationships are work (laughs) <laughs> yeah. you know or they're not going to be exciting all the time and I, I was sort of laughing because it's you know these are very basic things to say but people seem to need this message so badly um, I need to hear it like over and over and over and over again because our expectations have become so bizarre I mean as you said it's it's insane especially with monogamy I feel like mo- like people around everyone's trying polyamory or being more open and, and all of that and understanding that being monogamous is hard. But I personally think I reject the the mindset of like we're not made to be monogamous. I could because I think it, like marriage is something that we created. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's not going to feel like it works all the time, but it's a choice to have. Mm-hmm. But. What are your viewpoints on monog? I mean, I know Freud said he didn't think it, but like, you might have different ones than. I mean, I I think it's incredibly complicated and difficult, and I you know I think we should try to invent as much as we can. The thing that I've seen with the polyamory is um, that people are really running away from the boredom, the bored boredom moments in a relationship. And they're also running away from um, the jealousy because part of what happens in monogamy is that you get extremely possessive of the person you're with. Yeah. Um, And you're liable to all kinds of jealousies if you have the fantasy that they're cheating on you or if they do cheat on you or whatever it is. So when you're like, I'm polyamorous, then you kind of wipe off the table all of those desires to possess the person that you love i'm not allowed to be jealous right i'm not allowed to be jealous and you're trying to like even the playing field well she fucked that guy so i fucked this person and like we're we're even yeah yeah yeah. so there's like this like point system that's like going on Mm -hmm. a lot in these polyamorous relationships and you know i think you know i have to help people with that as much as i would have to help a monogamous couple deal with boredom or fears or the difficulties with possessiveness or whatever it would be. Um, I have no idea what's, I have no preference. I have no, yeah. I mean, I I stay pretty neutral about these things. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, one of the things, I mean, just with like, cause all the millennials are polyamorous or whatever, is that they seem to have a really, really hard time with, with jealousy, they like want to not feel jealous. And I, you know, we were talking about penis envy and then we were also talking about like yeah. broadcasting your life and getting followers and then you can stalk people on Instagram. I mean, there's a whole, mm-hmm. there's a whole world right now where you can see what your partner is doing and fuel your insane fantasies and jealousy. See what, yeah. And like, who's that? 
Yeah, and yeah. who just followed you and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Instagram stalking is wild. So I'm not surprised that the response is polyamory is an attempt to mitigate feelings that are being, or that are really out of control. Yeah, people don't, I think one of the interesting, most interesting things about people, uh, everyone included, is that we feel shame and guilty about our own feelings, Mm -hmm. which is, uh, seems very counterintuitive, but also makes sense. But it's like, we're having them. And so one of the the things that I talk about to friends, even on the show, is that everyone thinks that whatever they're thinking, they've only had that thought (laughs) or like, no one feels as sad as me. No one no one is as crazy me or, or, or I'm weird for having this. And I don't know who said it, but it's like statistically, there's no way. Like statistically, other people have had very similar thoughts to you and felt weird. And a big part of my life and what I've done on this show and just in people in general is like embracing whatever fucking weird thought you've had. Mm-hmm. And number one, realizing like it's your, it's your brain. It's not necessarily you. Mm-hmm. Or I mean, you might say it's something from your unconscious and then that – now freaks me out and now I'm like every single thought I have I'm like okay well I have some subconscious thing to whatever that is it's probably some weird sexual desire okay mm-hmm. great I have to deal with that but um, people feel shame about it and it's like mm-hmm. you're not the only person feeling jealous like most people are jealous mm-hmm. even I'm not I'm not a jealous person for whatever reason it's probably because Instead of being jealous, I just tell myself I'd be fine if they like, you know what I mean? Which is a defense mechanism, whatever. <laughs> we all, I'm like aware enough of some of my issues, right. but I can't fix them. Um, but I've got time. Uh, but I, I don't know. What is the, the desire to feel shame for our emotions? I mean, shame for like in, psychoanalytically speaking is shame, guilt, and morality are what we use to kind of keep our sexual drives in check. So as a child, you know, you are shamed, you are guilted, and you are given moral lessons. So, you know, Mm -hmm. stop touching your penis, you can't do this kind of thing, that's not good, you know. So we're constantly disciplining children. Mm -hmm. And then we're haunted by that for the rest of our life, unfortunately. So, like, just because a child has very basic, you know, a child just wants to kind of do whatever it wants to do, and then the world says, like, no, that's not good, you can't do that, then we carry this forward, and we keep trying to find methods that are less shame-inducing or less guilting or less morally punitive. As parents? Yeah, as yeah. parents, but you still, you, you still have to limit your children. Yeah. You still have to, like, limit yeah, you, them and shape them. You can't have your child pulling his dick out in the middle of class. Right. Yeah. Yes. And, and they want to. So. Yeah. <laughs> because they think it's funny. And yeah. honestly, it is funny. It's yeah. kind of funny. It's very funny. But, I mean, right. it's going to freak people out. It's going to freak and people it's out. Un- and it's inappropriate. So right. it's like, how do you – how do I tell my little kid that it's okay that he has, like, a penis and that it's, like – I mean, I don't know. I don't think I want him to be touched. T- t- and then it gets into like, how, what do you think is right or wrong? But it's like, how do you make him not ashamed of it, but also be like, hey, man, look, we're in a, like, do I just go, look, dude, we're in a society and you can't just be showing it to everyone, but you shouldn't be ashamed of it. And um, when you're in private until you get to age, then you can, like, what, you know what I mean? How do you? I, you know, I I think it's inevitable. I mean, the idea that, like, you know, you can't just have sex in the middle of the street, you know, that we have to put on clothes. Like, everything kind of makes something off limits. And then the experience of doing these things that we do in private that other people don't know about, the fact that we have private thoughts that we don't express to everyone, mm-hmm. creates these fields where there's these limits. And, you know, what do you show? What do you not show? And I think this is just the conundrum of being human. The point, hopefully, is that people aren't just collapsing in their shame and guilt, which most people are. Uh, yes. Um, but that, you know, eventually they find a place to express some of these things in a way that feels satisfying to them. Because I think part of the problem is that unless you find a medium for yourself, 
artistic, whatever it would be, family, something that feels satisfying, you're always going to be in a kind of cycle of having urges and feeling shamed and feeling guilty and feeling like you're not where you should be or doing what you want to do, so on and so forth. Um, you know, and that's a really tall order to say that, you know, we need to help everyone in society find at least some forms of satisfaction, especially in our world, which isn't particularly satisfying. And this is why Freud said he doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know if we're going to blow ourselves into smithereens or whether Eros will win. And by Eros, he meant like sensuality and satisfaction and the kind of better sides of the libido. Um, so he really wasn't sure because he didn't see looking at the way civilization was forming mm -hmm. that we were providing people with enough for them not to neurotically explode. Yeah, I feel like sexuality is never talked about. Um, no. Or, no. And like it's talked about as this other thing. And I mean, my parents barely talked to me about it. And my mom did a little bit. What was good about her is that she was always she was very much like bodies are beautiful, like very much making mm -hmm. it okay that you shouldn't feel ashamed of. But it's still there wasn't a talk about like if you have an urge or desire as like that's okay mm -hmm. and you should embrace it mm -hmm. and whatever it is and investigate it and go down that road and you shouldn't feel weird about it and but that's also like a very hard I guess conversation. To have, especially when I guess you don't know what the other person, like what level they're on. Like with each new part or like, which, you don't know where right. they're at, you know? Mm -hmm. But then I just got reminded of something you were talking about the debasement um, with men like uh, ages ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, eons. Ago. Eons. But what I've noticed, and I think people have talked about it, is more than ever. I've noticed more and more women like asking to be choked, mm -hmm. which I think is like, first of all, something I'm usually not down with because I'm like, this reminds me of murdering someone. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not, you want to do that? Like, I have no problem with it. But it is interesting to go 10 years ago when one of my friends told me he did that, I was like, that's wild. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll ever do that or have someone ask. And now it feels like, that's more of the norm. Mm -hmm. Like, and I don't think it's just, oh, have your kink. Everyone talks about it or whatever. It feels like that feels like a form of the debasement, but that women are requesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of what you see is that what you do in your sex life is um, the things you're trying to master something that you actually experience is like impossible in your daily life. So, like, you know, the, the stereotypical, like, CEO who wants to go to the dominatrix and get, like, beat up and whipped and humiliated is yes. because he can't handle those feelings in his life and he has to be, like, the big man. And so he oh. needs to go sexually enjoy the thing that is the least enjoyable thing in his life. Oh, I always looked at it as it never happened to him, so he wanted whatever happens. But you're saying it's him dealing with the fact that he um, doesn't like those things and doesn't want them in normal life. Yeah. Okay, because that's a little bit different. And he goes okay. and turns them into a sexually exciting scenario that he's also in control of, by the way, because mm -hmm. he says, do this to me. It's not just someone doing it to him. True. So he, he's even in power, even though he's not in power. Right. Okay. It's like this whole new thing with these men who go to the dominatrixes, but all they want to do is have the woman like force them to take money out of the ATM machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's um. <laughs> what is fuck. that called? Not like oh my god, something uh, f something doming uh, like because there's like Fed doming or something doming. It's where they just take money. Right. And fin doming. That's what it is. Financial domination. Financial domination. Fin dom. Amazing. Yeah. And why I know that, don't ask me, but someone talked about it. That's, I was talking to a girl about it at a comedy show and <laughs> like how it's almost exclusively right. women doing it to men. But I was like, I would do that to a girl. That'd be great. <laughs> I need money. But, uh, but yeah, that's like another kink of, I guess, having so much money that you want someone to use it. 
Well, I mean, being afraid probably that people only want you for your money and having put yourself into a position where you use your money to get people to want you, but that doesn't ever feel very good for those people. So then they have to go... To have and then consciously to, be like, I'm going to make this about my money. Yeah, or I'm going to have this woman rob me and I'm going to experience that, mm -hmm. this woman who just wants me for my money, but I'm going to be in control of it and I'm going to get off on it. Um... But Which, how, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, but how do you explain... The choking? Yeah, because I just... It, it's just a, a counterpoint, I, not a counterpoint, but well, something I would bring I mean, up with the debasement thing where I'm like... But women have... I mean, women historically, you know, there's a certain yes. point when you couldn't say this, have had rape fantasies. So I think, you know, women are really... It's scary to have sex with men or have to think about, how, you know, or like it's scary to think about being raped. So it's some way oh, of trying sure. to conquer... To conquer that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Control it. Make it exciting. Make it not something terrifying. By you, you're uh, by you requesting it. It's just you what, know it's, it's like, like what, yeah. It's I like know. What I get little it. Kids do like they go to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Which is scary. This person like pokes and prods them, and they have to get yeah. naked. And who is this person in the white coat? Mm -hmm. And then they go home and they do it to their dolls. They play doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And they, like, do all the things that were done to them, to their dolls. So that's what's happening oh. with the kinks. Yeah, someone wouldn't want you to potentially say that, like, women have rape fantasies because... It it sounds like they want exactly. rape, but, but it's, the, that's no. not it. Yeah, yeah it's, the fan, it's not the fantasy of, like, women are, are, are walking home from the train, like, God, I wish a guy would break into my apartment. It's that they've all worried about that that might happen. Yeah. And so in order to, I guess, combat it, they go, I'm going to, it's almost like a proactive thing of your brain being like, well, now I get to use it. Right. And be, because at the end of the day, I know it's not going to actually. But Freud felt that acting out, which mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd like, again, I don't think that it, people shouldn't have their strange kinks and pleasures and act them out. But yeah. um, he was worried about acting out because acting out, like you don't actually get to kind of, it, it's very difficult to work it over. You kind of end up getting stuck doing the same thing over and over again, which is why, you know, it's not like the fin dom people don't have to go get fin domed over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. It doesn't really, it doesn't really solve the problem, which needs kind of probably some mental elaboration and probably someone's help. But it's easier. <laughs> well, it's more fun to go yes, to see get, a prostitute. To get, yeah, to get fin down Or whatever. But yeah. <laughs> but okay, so then... And to confront... So yeah. a lot of these kinks could be the side effect or the effect of not coming to terms with some kind of um, underlying, whether it be desire, fear, anxiety... Yeah, I mean, we're not allowed to say that anymore either. I know there's, like, you're not allowed to say all kinds of things because we don't want to pathologize sex. Um, and that sex sexuality is an arena that can be incredibly healing because you confront all kinds of things that, you know, you mm -hmm. that you are ashamed of or, you know, yeah. haven't experienced. But I do worry about it when it becomes repetitive. That was Freud's biggest enemy. He was okay, like, if things are repetitive, repetitive, static, fixed... Like the Freudian fixation, uh -huh. this is bad. He just wants things to be fluid. He wants things to be open. He wants it to be mobile. He wants you to have as many choices as possible available to you. Okay, so like you're saying, once every now and then, the girl's like, oh, tr or like, oh, do this or do that. Right. That's fine. But if every single time it's like, this is what I need, yeah, then there's an issue that you need to be choked, over or over or whatever, again. like or whatever, whatever kink it is. It is. Yeah. There's an issue that you that's underlying that that you need to maybe investigate. Yeah, was I think maybe one of the like what I'm thinking now talking about it is maybe one of the preoccupations that people have with Freudian psychology is that it almost seems like it just revolves around sex <laughs> and like libido. You know, yeah. like libido is a big thing there. And how would you define libido? I mean, libido is just energy. I mean, it's yes. essentially what that means, um, or drive. So the word, like, drive and libido were kind of exchangeable for Freud. And, and he felt that the drives were essentially either sexual or aggressive. S and that you never actually find one in any pure culture. So it's sex and aggression together. 
um, and that this is what society restricts. We restrict sexual, we restrict expressions of sexuality, and we restrict expressions of aggression in order to live together as human beings. Um, and but we can't ultimately do it. So this is the problem: is that as civilization evolves, we're like we have to invent new ways of managing the fact that we're all sexually aggressive people. That we're sexual and aggressive. Yeah. So he put it down to just two bases, which is two basic drives: sex and aggression. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You think most of our life is just sex and aggression? No, I think most of our life is um, all of the elaborate constructions, okay. both by the world and in our minds, to mm-hmm. put a lid on the fundamental kind of sexual and aggressive urges that we have. What are th- I think it's harder for me to understand the aggressive side than the sexual side. Really? If you look around this world? But, uh, so, well, maybe el- elucidate <laughs> to me because maybe I'm just not thinking. I mean, you know, when it, the world is, we're all killing each other. I mean, we're, you know, it's. No, 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 I understand that we're aggressive beings. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like, we're one step away from chimps and apes. Like, it's not. But I'm saying, if I think about everything that I did today, it's like, how, how was I trying to put a cap on my aggression? I mean, I'm besides going to the gym, even though, like, I use that as. Oh, when like, when like someone knocked into you in the subway and you didn't want to push them back or, you know, when your friend sent you the email that was maybe a little kind of rude. You yeah, didn't you wanna, feel that. You didn't want to, you know. Yeah. yeah, you feel that. Yeah. But well, then you see it and you go, oh, that was weird, you know. Well, you're much more enlightened. I mean, I, you know, have to spend couple hours trying to calm myself down <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> feel like she's, feeling, she's been feeling aggressive the entire time <laughs> trying to okay but the yeah i mean wanting to win you're always when you're yes, winning you're win, at the yes. expense of somebody basically else basically killing someone yeah. whether it be um real or i mean most of the time it's fictitious or or uh like metaphorical I mean, you know, competition is a way that we're trying to kind of funnel aggression into, like, healthy competition. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, competition isn't that healthy. You don't think so? (laughs) Well, I'm, it. you know, you end up in this kind of dog-eat-dog world if the competition's so uncontrolled versus, like, you know, something that's maybe a little more harmonious as an ideal, which we don't have anymore. We sort of, like, we put everything into a competition. Win or lose. I think competition leads towards innovation and, like, creating the best of something. But what you're saying is unchecked competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want no no competition. No, no, no. no. Yes. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, the sexual... Yeah. I don't know. It's a hard... So you you have a son. I do. And... When you were seeing him grow up, did you have an idea of, oh, this is how I'm going to try and make sexuality like more okay with him? Or, I mean, one thing you're supposed to not be with your child is a psychoanalyst. You're supposed to be a parent, which is why you know, like I when I you're not I, supposed to be, but you're not supposed to be. But I also knew that like the craziest people were the kids of shrink, so I was always very worried yeah. about this. So I really didn't want to analyze him. I just okay. wanted to like be with him. But I mean, I certainly knew, you know, like as I said, like during the Edelpool period, I was like, oh wow, like oh this is real. Yeah, I read about it, but now it's happening. Um, but it's tough because I, as a mother. You have to be careful not to overstimulate your son. Mm-hmm. That's like one of the things that was very important to me was to have like a lot of boundaries with him. And so it was very it was very difficult for me to think of how to talk to him about sex without stepping over the line completely just by virtue of doing it as his mother. You know, it almost feels like something is father needed to do it shouldn't be something that I should do. It's just gonna be a little yes. weird when your mom talks to you about sex. Um, okay. But, you know, I remember one time a sex scene came onto the 
the TV. TV and I think the I think it was like like you know like full nudity or something mm-hmm. and I put my hands over his eyes just to like you know to like not shame him but also be like you know you're with your mother and like this is yeah, a little weird so gross. like I thought I should play a little bit with like we're not uh-huh. going to look at this together and he knocked my hand away and stared at it in front of me like almost to let me know like something about the fact that he was going to watch and I, I remember as a moment I was really surprised it was really a surprising kind of impulse on his side I can't believe I'm going to say this in public defiant yeah it was a defiance um, which I thought was probably good. I thought it was, you know, at the moment I thought this is probably a good thing that he's defiantly expressing his sexuality against me, which also shows that when I put my hand up to censor mm-hmm. it, that I did my job as a parent, which is to say, like, you know. Yes, you shouldn't, but then him as a slowly be, like. Like becoming a man. A, a man is like, no, I want to. Yeah. Which, ah, oh, that's interesting. That's cool. Yeah, seeing, like. Yeah. I don't want kids for a while, but it, I I do think it'll be fascinating to like watch a human being grow and see all the insane like you in them, but then also right. see them become their own person. Yeah. So, so what was scary. that show? Oh God, I saw it recently. I can't remember the name of it. It was Sex Education. Yeah. With the mother. I watched it. It's great. It's great. Yeah, but th- I didn't want to be. I really didn't want to be that person. You don't want to be that mother. Yeah. That mother. Yeah. yeah, she's a little bit over the... Wait, but then he can't. She, like, she puts all... Yeah, he all can't the, have he, sex, he can't, yeah. Yeah. Because his mom is, like, too open about it. Right. There's no point of yeah. defiance, which sexuality has to be something that you kind of assume and are a little defiant about. You know, this is what I like. Yeah, I guess I was a little defiant to my dad. Yeah, because he didn't talk to me about it at all, mm-hmm. which was fine, you know? It's like when you look back, you go, oh, that didn't happen, but... I mean, that's also why you have friends, Part of me is like, I want to talk to my kids about it, but at the same time, like, no. they, that's why they have friends, dude. And then they figure it out, and then I'll have certain talks to be like, you know, here are some things that you, you this is how you never treat someone, so they're not a monster. Mm-hmm. But you know, besides that, figure it out. You got to feel like your own person. Well, the other thing is that kids learn. I mean, there are moments that are really important you know, of speaking moments with your children, but it's also more you as a model. So, you know, I think, you know, for like the little girls that I see, seeing a woman who like seems to derive satisfaction as a woman, being a woman, being a sexual woman, being a professional woman, Mm -hmm. that there's some possibility there that we don't feel like life is, you know, that motherhood has destroyed us, that our professions are killing us, that like Mm -hmm. our relationships are, you know, turning us inside out. Like, this is what's hard for kids to see, right? So this is why there is something about each of us finding, um, you know, a contentment. I don't like happiness, but to find that, you know, the things that we engage in satisfy us to a certain extent from time to time um, is really important for kids to see. Did you have a female figure growing up that you remember emulating? I mean, there. I had female figures, but then they got destroyed later, and I think that that was really hard for me. Um, you know, like I had like the idealization of a child, and then the reality didn't pan out, and that's a very hard thing to experience. But the idealization, the fact that it existed at all, it's is good. why is good, which is why I'm not like in a sewer. Yes. Um, <laughs> Even though it sounds like you need some psychoanalysis I was close. to be I was close, close to, to that. the sewer. Um, so, and I, you know, I remember really searching for models. And one of the ones I found who actually became the supervisor of my dissertation, I, I realized this in analysis, how important it was. But when I was 18, I went to these um, meetings of psychoanalysts mm-hmm. and I saw this woman walk in. She was so beautiful and she was so yeah. smart. And I like, I like couldn't believe the way she like sat down and put her bag down. I think it was the moment when I'm like, oh, I want to be her. Uh you know, and you have to you have to find that. And it was a kind of redo of my parents because my my mother and all of her sisters were female doctors. So it's like to find a different female doctor figure that I could want to be like since I didn't want to be like them anymore after a certain period yeah, of time. Yeah, you grow up and you don't want to like They didn't that was what wasn't panning out so well for me. So uh, <laughs> Did you try to be a doctor? 
Well, I am a doctor, but I'm yeah, not well, like a medical yes. doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I well, think that was it. It was like I had to find a little bit of a shift away. Yeah, you're like, I want to be my own kind I'm of... I want to be my own doctor. Doctor, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. not, I'm not going to do surgery. I'm going to do metaphorical surgery <laughs> right. on the unconscious of That's people. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's. I mean, it's cooler, honestly, in some ways. Uh-huh. I mean, surgery is fucking awesome. Yeah. But, you know, tapping into someone's... It's different every day. The one thing I would say about being a surgeon, like if you're like a hip mm-hmm. replacement, person, exactly, like you know how like to replace a like hip. You, but then you have to replace like a million hips. Yeah. Whereas like every day, every hour for me is totally wild and different. Are you uh, consistently surprised by people sometimes, or I am? It's not like there aren't the repetitive moments or the moments when you're like really trying to wait for something to happen. But um, yeah, sometimes I, I feel bad when I talk. Yeah. Like I'll bring stuff up to my therapist, and I'm like. I know I've said this like six times before. I'm like, I'm sorry. We're 600. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's 600, exactly. I'm sorry we're doing this right. again. But yeah, how, like, I guess it's learned, it has to be learned for you to each time with a patient go, I don't care that you said it, like, this is one more time we're getting closer to maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and also it's my job to, to live through that, but also try to do something in that moment, you know, mm-hmm. just not let them repeat the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again what inspired you to write the book the most recent one um just how important the body is to psychoanalysis and how like i think it's having a resurgence today in terms of the place that it's holding in society i mean we're like obsessed with our bodies from like plastic surgery to the medications to the gym to the wellness industry to the whatever um, yeah, I'm definitely obsessed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. but I was like so confused. We're so confused by our bodies because it's like we have to do all of this stuff to it, and it's you know it's still not kind of working the way that we sort of expected to. And that this was like kind of point A for for it. Like when he talks about sex and aggression, he's really talking about what it means to be a human being with a body that then also has a language. Like that the language and the body thing are like very weird and they don't work out very well. Like together. the language of your body? No, no, no like the fact that we speak. And oh. like, that like we exist in like a linguistic world, but then also have these this body that the two are like crashing into each other. Really? How's like, how, what did he think that created? Like what issues did that? It just created on uh, discontent. I mean, animals don't have language and they live a little bit more seamlessly. No. Some kind of like they call and response and they have some kind of communication. Yeah. But they don't have complex... They don't have to interpret so much yeah. what the other person is saying. Yeah, it's like the whole body language <laughs> what thing. What do you mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. there's not, you know, there's not You have not to look that. at what someone's doing compared right. to, like, what I mean, for it said saying. to ask about the meaning of life is to be neurotic. And, you know, I mean, we don't know what's going on with animals, but I, I don't think that they ask what the meaning of their life not is. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. But most people would... So does that mean most people are neurotic to some sense that we're yeah, yeah, that's what ask, I meant. asking yeah. about the meaning of life? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's a productive question to ask? Um, well, I think it makes people do all kinds of things, but I don't think that we get anywhere with it and we make ourselves feel really bad in the process. I mean, you know, like all of the the new age stuff of like the power of now and like just be, and, mm-hmm. I, and I do believe in that. I believe that you know we're trying to find that state. It's just it's really tough. It's like we almost want to be the animal that's yeah. unaware. Yeah. yeah, like the the most um, <laughs> the the most not happy but like calm I've ever been was uh, a month ago. I did this event for Hulu, and mm-hmm. they dressed me up as um, Butchie, uh, Billy Butcherson from Hocus Pocus. He was a zombie in it. I don't even know who he is, but it was three and a half hours of special effects makeup. Right. And so in that three and a half hours, it was a brand new experience for me, and it was very uh, tactile and like hands-on. Uh, I realized three hours later that I hadn't thought about anything for three hours, <laughs> nice. and I was like, that's the. Mo- I wish I could get that in a drug. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I know we're not supposed to want to take drugs, like, you know, but it was so nice to go, oh, I just was there and just mm-hmm. experiencing what it was and talking to these people. Like, you know, I, I wasn't a zombie. I was talking to them, but I wasn't having that background. It's like most of the time, even 
during most conversations, you're talking to someone and then in the background, there's like another record playing, which is, oh, yeah. I guess you would maybe call it the unconscious, which, no? No, that's, that's, that's consciousness. That's, okay, that's, that's that, consciousness. That's what's horrible about consciousness. But then are things coming up from, or is that just consciousness thinking different things? The background noise? Well, but a random thought coming up. Oh, that's great. That's good. That's good. That's we good. like those. Yeah, okay. we like that. Now, does that mean something... That means something bubbled up. Now, does that bubbled up have anything to do with the conversation and it being connected to something from the past? Or is it maybe just a random bubbling up? It, does, it could be connected to mm -hmm. the conversation or it could be random. I mean, it could just be the kind of thing that's trying to get to find its little way in. Got it. Um, I don't. The thing that I don't like is the self consciousness, like the the thinking about what you're thinking about, the thinking about what you're saying, yeah, the anxiety the about what's happening. That you know, the, this is what we're trying to get people out of, and that's why the you know the, I was making fun of the new age sort of power of now. Mm -hmm. But I do think when you're in a place where you can just let it like come out, you know, mm -hmm. or not think and just allow what's happening to happen, like that's the ideal. That's the. I mean, people love this. They talk about getting in the flow. Is it, you know? Flow state, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's real. It's real. Definitely a real thing. It's a real thing. Yeah. And when you when you talk about letting it pop up, I th the the I, last thing that like the attention. Mm -hmm. People talk about atten you talked about it in the article, attention. We we're number one, we're all trying to be like better at paying attention, which I think the more you try and do it like I'm not sure what I think about attention, whether it's a finite thing or something you can fully control mm -hmm. or if it has to be trained. I'm not sure. Right. But what I have realized is that when I can't think of something or I feel off, if I try harder, it f just f like fucks it up more. Yeah. And then sometimes when you don't try or all the, or like you'll be trying to think of someone's name. And then you can't get it. And no. then two hours later, you'll like think back and then it'll immediately come to you because you're not really trying that hard. Mm -hmm. And it's the most frustrating thing ever. Well, this is what the psychopathology of everyday life is about for its okay. book. Was the um, was about the errors, the slips of the tongue, the mistakes that we make. So that's when we l our attention lapses. And actually something kind of interesting can happen. Like Freudian slips. Freudian slips. But exactly. how much has that term been hijacked to not mean what it actually means? Um, like, do you think every time someone says, uh, nice to fuck you, I mean, meet you, like they're at, or are they just, I mean, that one's pretty, pretty obvious, <laughs> but like, I'm trying to, there, there have been times. I'm like, what are you trying to yeah, say? Yeah, yeah. There, there, yeah, there have been times where like, I've said something completely but it, it has not felt like it has had any <laughs> application to where I'm at. And I've just like, been like, okay, that was, that was weird. Or I just thought of the wrong word. Do you, uh, do I, do I like believe in the 40 and slip? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you know, like every single time, I yes. don't know, but I mean, in the, in the important times, definitely. And you know, when it's important. I mean, I was saying to someone the other day, travel to France, and I, me I meant to say travel to France, and I said tramps, uh -huh. and like I had to spend some time and think about what that was about, but it was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely I have a super <laughs> embarrassing one, oh, yeah. super embarrassing, that bringing it up now is going to make me definitely... I still don't think it means anything, uh -huh. but it's so pertinent to what we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. that it's like hilarious. My dad got remarried, mm -hmm. and at his wedding, I was supposed to introduce them. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mr. and Mr., instead of Jim Paladino, I said Dylan Paladino. And dude, it was the most embarrassing thing <laughs> ever. And I remember thinking it's also in my the most eatable thing. Th that's ever. what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but I am not attracted to her at all. Like at all. I it's not saying that I I'm not gonna say I don't like her because that would be really mean to say. I love her, she's great. But mm -hmm. I was like, I've never had that, I've never consciously but why had do you think any it's urge about towards her as opposed to eclipsing your father. Oh. Mm. She, you guys see her? <laughs> As she sips her tea, damn. 
Like, yeah, I mean, that makes oh, a lot see, more that sense. That was the psychoanalytic move because I said it and sipped my tea so uh-huh. that you couldn't, like, so that I wasn't looking at you when I said it. Oh, is that a move? <laughs> to not look? It feels to not make eye move, To yeah. not make eye contact? Just be like, mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I'm not really thinking. And then I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, I guess maybe the, the, the eclipsing your father thing makes makes a lot more sense. But then you feel bad about being like, you know, I don't hate my dad. I don't want to, you know, that's, and then that's, and then that shame thing. Yeah. It's also probably, you know, it should be your turn to get married, not his at this point. But fuck that. (laughs) Hell no. Hell no. I am so okay with being (laughs) single and not married until to the behest of some exes, like until in no, my thirties. It's just a funny thing because you think, you know, your parents get married and then mm. it's then you're next. But then it's yes. funny to think of being at your parents' wedding. I mean I was too, I was at my father's wedding. And I looked back at those pictures, I was like seventeen or something at uh-huh. my father's wedding. I wore white. Oh. And I remember picking out this white outfit. I mean it was later when I was in analysis that I looked back on it and I'm like you do like you're not allowed to wear white to a wedding. Only the bride wears white. I wore white to my father's. Oh, wedding. they let you wear it. Yeah. Well, they didn't let me. I went out. I had ran out and bought an mm-hmm. outfit. Oh, last minute. Yeah. Yeah. See, the like Occam's razor part of me wants to be like, no, you just like the white outfit. But then it is cooler to be like, no, but you wanted to be mm-hmm. married. Not necessarily that you want to. That's my thing. It's is a that rival. It's like, I think there was a, definitely a rivalry. There's, yeah, no, there there's is definitely a rivalry. That's what that I have never felt that rivalry. Rivalry with my stepfather, luckily, uh-huh. because I think I'm just so much um, bigger than him physically. Uh-huh. So I've never felt threatened by him. <laughs> you know, which yeah. is like I can say that and not feel weird about it. I'm just right. like, oh, okay, that's probably why I've never felt threatened by right. it. But this is how you handle jealousy. It's like, yeah, it's cool. It's fine. You're right. Yeah. I'm good. If it ever came to that, I'd win. Uh, yeah, pushing it. <laughs> I only get jealous when I'm not, um, like, securely with someone. Right. Like, in the beginning phases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is, I've always, like, tried to go, why the fuck would I care? In those, but that's again, it's because like I'm unsure. Mm-hmm. It's like as soon as you go, yeah, we're good. I'm like, okay, sweet. I don't, you know, I'm chilling. Yeah. Yeah. That makes uncertainty rough though when there's a lot of that around. What uncertainty? Yeah. I mean, my life is uncertainty. It's, I've chosen that life. Mm-hmm. Which, <laughs> which is again, <laughs> which has made you anxious. It has. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing for me and some people don't know that they're anxious. And that was a big awakening for me mm-hmm. was from like 23 to 25. I think that's when it like, I, I truly don't remember being anxious in, in college mm-hmm. and even in my early 20s. Probably because I had, a, I had a purpose. I had a mission. I was still younger. I wasn't overthinking anything. I was in school. I was good at school. So I was, I had more self-worth than I do now. And I was like, okay, I'm good. And then as I got out and tried to figure out the career and stuff didn't perfectly go well, then you started thinking about all of it. But I think for a couple of years, I didn't realize that it was anxiety. I just thought I was like stressed Mm -hmm. and always thinking in the future. And finally, my friend asked me to go to the museum with him for a couple hours. And I was like, I can't do it because when I'm there, I'm just going to be thinking about what I have to do when I get home. And then, and he's like, dude, that's anxiety, bro. And when he said that, I finally went, oh shit, I have, like, I need to talk to someone. Mm-hmm. And I think more people need to at least, even just, number one, be okay with having it. Number two, know what it is. Mm-hmm. Because if you haven't, no one like can go in your brain and mm-hmm. go like, oh, see that feeling right there? That's what that is. So now you know what it is and now you can pinpoint pinpoint it. For a while, you're just like, oh, I feel like flustered, you know? And then, like, I remember girls before would always be like, you're anxious. And I'm like, no, I'm fucking not. I'd be like, that's not, yeah, yeah, that's not a a thing. Which again was like, it means you're weak to be anxious, you know? Um, But 
it was super helpful to like realize it. Yeah. Because then you go, oh, okay, now now it sucks to know it, but now you have something to focus on dealing with instead of before just going, okay, I'm going to like feel like that. Freud hated anxiety. It was a big problem for him. And he actually, it was one of the, he didn't change a lot of his theories. He added to them and he made them more complex, but he completely changed his theory of anxiety at the end of his life. What did he change it to? So he thought that um, anxiety happened after repression, Mm -hmm. but actually he says it's prior to repression. So actually we need to repress the anxiety. We need repression to function in some way. And um, in order to make the anxiety go away. So, you know, like if you, just to give like a kind of lame example, Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that we're just constantly worried about money, about life, about all these things means that, you know, there's, we can't just repress that and then, like, get on with life. It's just there stirring everything up all the time. Uh, okay. Um, so anxiety needs repression rather than it being the result of repression was the way that he, um, he flipped it around. And, you know, if there's too much overwhelming you, if, like, you're reliving your worst moments because Mm -hmm. things are falling apart for you today and it feels like when you were a child and things were terrible and, like, you know, the world that you thought was your world turned out to be a different world, um, you know, repression's not operating just to, like, put all that away and get on with our life. So he thought repression was a good thing. He did. Yeah, it's a it's a necessity. It's necessary. It helps, you know, like when it when it's when it's not too excessive or when it's not too little. Sort of like, you know, okay. the right amount of the repression. Right, yeah, yeah, just the, yeah, like the, yeah. Three, the three little bears. Yeah. Uh, the Goldilocks <laughs> repression. That's what you called it, yeah. the Goldilocks repression. I love that theory, yes. the Goldilocks yeah. repression the theory. The Goldilocks repression theory. I coined, <laughs> coined that. <laughs> okay, because I, I think a lot of people look at repression as a bad thing. Yeah, no. as, as you shouldn't push it down. You need to, like, let it out. But for certain fears, you're saying... Yeah, we need to... We can't walk around thinking that we're going to die all the time. Um, you know. Do you think anxiety is helpful, though? <sighs> no. <laughs> no? Fear is helpful mm-hmm. when it's called for. You know, like, fear has an object. I am afraid that, you know, right now this boat is going to, you know, whatever, and I need to get out of the situation I'm in. But anxiety is objectless. It's, like, about nothing. And then it can travel around like a amorphous blob and attach itself to anything it's terrible yeah not good but we have it more than ever now yeah probably because of social media probably because of social media because we're always thinking about what other people are doing but you, and you can turn to the phone I just started sewing which just seems so silly and like a middle aged lady thing to do I but, love it um, no I love that that's great anything with your hands that's not your phone yeah <laughs> because it, it, it makes me feel really sick you know and I pay attention to these things and I was like this makes me sick when I'm on it for more than 25 minutes my brain starts to hurt yeah and then and then I've noticed that if I feel um, focused and like good if I go on it, I'll start to feel fractured and yes. all over the place because of all the different. Because it's kind of like um, constant stimulation that's then causing your brain to go off and like to not bifurcate, but like fork on all these different yeah. pathways and think about My a million different is going things. To hell, because you know you just like the email, the text message, the whatever, the Instagram. Like you just you just scattered. It's terrible. So you think people should try and. Turn as many of the notifications off. and I think that we have to control our impulse to just touch the stupid thing. Yeah, that is a... Yeah, I mean, you know, when it's not, like, next to you, people freak out. I mean, I understand that. Like, I'm like, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Um, so it's really become a strange thing in our lives. Uh, and, you know, it's also, like, you know, the whole I'd psychoanalytic idea is that you, you know, you let your mind work on things. You let the consolidation happen on its own. And I feel like this is just interrupting it all the time. You know, it's not like the thoughts drift in and out. You work on things. You live your life a little bit. Things happen. You go back to the thoughts a little bit. It's like we're just in this, like, ping pong game with the phone and the notifications and the email and the onslaught and the... yeah. Um, so I've, I, I, I have never felt more scattered than I have 
as of late, which is why I started sewing. <laughs> so anything good? Um, I did. I'm actually having a lot of fun with wool painting, which sounds really bizarre, but like you literally stab wool into, um, into fabric and you can like mix the colors just like paint. Oh, yeah. that sounds cool. It's cool. Wool painting. A abstract embroidery. Ex okay. And the little Jackson Pollock. -y. Yeah. 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 That's good to just kind of like let your mind fully uh, rest, relax, rest, work in the background. Yeah. I found, I think you wrote about this, that uh, it was, um, you were talking about sleep. A lot of people are having problems with sleep. Yeah. A lot of people. And part of it, I think you said, was that we don't have that end of the day reprieve from everything and to allow you to slowly like fade away mm -hmm. into the non ego whatever mm -hmm. that is sleep and i think people don't realize how important that is yeah. to like stop everything i remember i <laughs> uh like two years ago i went on um i went on a date with a woman that was significantly older than me and uh like two years no uh but like she was um i think she was 40 and i was like 23 24 and i say i think because she wouldn't tell me how old she was mm -hmm. and i was like i don't care like just so then i tried to say <laughs> i was like were you born before or after the first star wars movie and she was like around that time and i was like okay so you're between 39 to 42 but uh I remember she said I turn my phone off at like 9.30 mm -hmm. and like I just don't answer anyone after that and then I go to sleep. And I remember that blew my mind because I was like, what do you do? Like, like what, do you, what do you mean you turn your phone on 9.30? What do you just sit around and stare at a wall? And now I'm like, yeah, you should do that. It's very helpful. Yeah. But no one, th everyone thinks that that's like, uh, it's just FOMO that you're like going to miss out on something. You're going to miss out on an email. You're like, there might not be something you, you might not be connected. I, f I feel like now more than ever, more relationships are not even romantic, just like friend relationships are like weirdly secure and insecure because you can talk to them all the time. But so like, if you don't hear from them a while, you're like, do they hate me? Yeah. Right. What are you doing? What's going on? You're like, literally nothing. But hey, what's up? Yeah. No, and it's also weird that it's the first thing that you look at. In the morning. In the morning. And, um, you know, because when you wake up, you know, not everyone can wake up slowly. I mean, we all have, like, things to do. But, you know, you remember your dreams. You kind of, like, wake up to the day. And you just cut all of that off the minute that you look at your phone. So, mm. I mean, I'm trying not to do it because I won't remember my dreams if I if Do you I have do a dream that. journal? I don't. But, you know, I, I mean, I think about them you a lot. I mean, I, I, if there's a really important one, I, I do write it down in the notes in my phone. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's been so easy in our lives. Right. What do you think is, uh, what if people don't dream? Do you think that's indicative of anything? No, everybody dreams. I mean, you'll, you'll die if you don't dream. It's like, you know, the it, REM. Ha it happens in the, yeah, in the REM cycle. And yeah. You need that. You need to get to that cycle. It's just not everyone remembers. And it's really just, I mean, I always tell my patients because they're like, I don't dream. Um, it's just a muscle. Like once you start flexing it, 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 it'll come back. You mean by really trying to remember your yeah. dreams? And then getting into the habit of it. Um, so you're saying if you go to sleep, it's impossible for you to go through all three sleep cycles and not hit REM? Yeah. Oh, okay. You will. I mean, you'll hit REM. You'll have a dream. You'll Even just, if it's you just like won't 20 seconds. Yeah. yeah. You just won't remember it is the problem. Oh, okay, yeah, because there's been nights when I'm like, someone just knocked me out and then I woke up. Yeah, you just didn't you just didn't remember your dream, but you had one. Oh. It's also why when some patients come and they're like, oh, I had some dream, but I don't really remember. It's already close It's already close to the session at that point, which is I'm like, you don't remember anything. Like, even if they just remember, like, the tiniest bit, mm -hmm. you can sometimes in the session get, you can get them back to the whole thing. Oh, I've had that happen where I'm talking to someone and I'm like, oh, oh shit, I just yes. remembered they stream. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's really cool. It's really Cause cool. Because it almost feels like you were thinking about it the entire time. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't, like. Also, the fact that something could so not be there and then appear. 
I think is incredible. I mean, it just shows you how much we don't know what's around in your mind. That's that's why I thought cognition was the interesting, most interesting part of. Uh, I don't know if it's considered part of psychology, but mm -hmm. I think it is because I took a cognition class. And I remember I found it fascinating how like everyone's trying, trying to figure out how the brain works in terms of like just like memory and all those things. And I remember I, the only real theory I remember was like the, the theory of like the, the yelling monster or goblin or something. And, um, and I remember my professor, he was at NYU. His name was Andy something. I don't remember his last name, but maybe I should try Cause he was, he was like really into it. You know, mm -hmm. those professors like, I mean, you're probably like this, that like they're just into it and confident about it. And like, they like talking about it so that it never feels like a, a chore. Mm -hmm. But he's explaining how one theory is that there's all the, it's uh, they're obviously in, made into a, a metaphor of a goblin, but mm -hmm. there's all these different neurons or whatever trying to say like, uh, it's this, it's this, it's this. And whichever one is loudest, that's the one that gets to the top and mm -hmm. then becomes that thought mm -hmm. or that um, memory. And, I remember going, I don't even truly understand that, but it's cool to think that that's maybe how it works. Mm -hmm. And so then when stuff like that happens, I go, maybe that was, you know, one of those goblins screaming and screaming. And then finally it got through the cracks mm -hmm. and was able to, I've never tried to analyze my dreams, but. Fred had a, a actually it's the one time that he mentions capitalism but he talks about in the interpretation of dreams that the dream is kind of like a capitalist like you you mm -hmm. have to the the thing that's going to make it into the dream has to have enough purchase power <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to think about it yeah. i like that yeah. yeah so freud one tiny little positivity about <laughs> capitalism yeah. was he pretty anti-capitalism or capitalist? No, he never explicitly talked about that. I mean, he had interesting ways of thinking about money and the the mm -hmm. transformation of money and its place in society. But he didn't. He didn't. He didn't want to weigh in on on the forms that civilization took. He just wanted to be neutral and analyze them. That was more his way. I mean, you know, Marx takes a perspective. Yes. Um, but you know, I think that he he sort of thought that civilization was was shitty. <laughs> that we made some amazing things along the way, but for the most part, you know, we were pretty barbaric. We are. Yeah. And we try to hide it. Yeah. I guess you're right. We're we, hiding we those aggressive. We weren't making a lot of progress when we thought we were with this great thing called the Enlightenment. But we were not. No. If people want to educate themselves about Freud mm -hmm. and how he's not a piece of shit. Yeah. What do you think they should, where should they go? Oh, Civilization is Discontents. It's an amazing book. It's really, it's really beautiful. It's really incredible. Um, it takes like these big views on like religion and pleasure and society and mm -hmm. even things like drinking and yoga. And, and he just like kind of goes into it. It gets it gets nuts at a certain point. He, but just he, go with it. Go with it. Go with it. He, it gets nuts when he has to talk about guilt and sadomasochism and the death drive. But he'll yeah. have paved the way there for you to deep dive with him at that point. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then. For people listening to find you, they can go on. T do you use Twitter a lot? Um, no, I use Instagram. Instagram, okay. Yeah. Do you, well. Is it a public Instagram or is it like you it's and public. your friends? Okay. Your Instagram is at Jameson Webster. At Jameson Webster, and your book. You have two books, right? I have three. Three. -ish, okay. Yeah. Three ish. Yeah. There's well four. Are you writing <laughs> one right now? No, that, that's five. Ah, yeah. What, what, it's, what are you working on right now? I'm working on the Cambridge introduction to Jacques Lacan. He's a French psychoanalyst. Um, okay. But it'll be nice because it's an introductory book. There's too many introductions to Lacan, but I'm doing my weird version with a colleague named Marcus Colin. Fantastic. And they should read your most uh, recent one. There's a abridged version of one of the chapters in the New York Review of Books called Riding in Cars with Jacques Lacan. Oh, that's part of your introduction? Yeah. Writing in Cars with Jacques Lacan? Yeah. Okay. In the New York Review of Books. It's a lot of fun. Actually. All right, it's sweet. Yeah. Check that one out. Check out <laughs> Psychopharmacology of Everyday Life. Honestly, read that. It'll If you're on any drugs, it'll <laughs> really make you second guess why you're on them and if you should be and maybe uh, to pull back from them. Caffeine, I think, is okay, right? I mean, 
Like it's the the lowered version of it gives you a tiny bit of megalomania, but it allows you to wake up and focus a little bit more, right? Yeah. Yeah, except for I I I wean myself off caffeine. I felt better. I mean, I'm back now. I'm back to drinking coffee. But the period of time that I wasn't on it was great. I woke up without it's like just, like slouching towards this thing that costs so much. It's just so good though. <laughs> yeah, that's my one vice, and it's so good. <laughs> tea, you can have tea, but all that stuff. Okay, thank you so much for doing this. Thank this you. This was great. Yeah. Guys, find her online. We'll talk to you soon, psychos.